So why, if you are you know, a liberal Democrat and you know these companies are murderous, that it's part of their business plan, that they are there, it's not even moral elasticity. It's a complete detachment from any kind of moral imperative at all. Why would you think that they're going to hurt people with all their other pharmaceutical products? The one product where they can never get caught and they can never be liable, even if they do get caught, they're suddenly going to find Jesus and be, you know, honorable. It it defies any kind of, you know, of um, logical uh, analysis. Hey, folks, welcome to the Dark Horse podcast. I have the distinct pleasure and honor of sitting today with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is the founder and chairman of Children's Health Defense and the founder of Waterkeeper Alliance. Welcome, Robert. Thank you, Brad. This may be Brett's last podcast. <laughs> Let's hope that's not the case. But uh, actually, I mean, you, you joke, but I think we should talk a little bit about the, the predicament here. Um, this is uncharted territory. And I want to tell you a little bit. I don't know how much um, you are aware, but I know uh, a great many people that we know in common. And I keep having a conversation with people that I respect who like and respect you, but are afraid to say so publicly because of the incredible pushback that you have gotten since, I guess, 2005. Is that fair? Yes. And uh, I must say, I wrestled with this myself. Um, you and I met some months ago, and I was uh, very heartened and reassured by the person that I met. You are clearly um, a patriot. You are clearly a person who is intensely committed to doing the right thing, and you have had to make incredible sacrifices um, sacrifices are something the Kennedy family has made uh, at a level that is almost impossible to imagine. And you have paid incredible prices personally for the stances that you have taken. And among other things, I just want to point out, I know that many people who do tune into this podcast will presumably uh, have disagreements with you, perhaps over the interpretation of evidence. But at the very least, you are clearly a person who believes in what he is doing and is willing to pay a price to get it done. And I don't think the world can ask any more of anyone, even if you were incorrect about the interpretation of the evidence, which I don't think you are. Uh, it would still be, um, it is still an absolute requirement for the rest of us to recognize that a person doing what they believe to be the right thing is an honorable person and should be treated as such. Well, I would, what I would say about that is this, that the, the character traits that you describe are all objectively uh, admirable traits, but I would not consider them admirable if they weren't accompanied by an additional trait, which was a willingness to look at contrary evidence and a willingness to recognize that you're wrong and to admit that if the evidence goes against one of your hypotheses or suppositions. And that's something I feel that um, is part of my makeup. That I, if somebody, you know, and I've said this from the beginning, show me data that says that I'm wrong and I will publicly, in fact, if you can show me data it shows that people, for example, who, who get the COVID vaccine are more likely to live and have healthier lives than people who aren't. I will fold my tent and go back to protecting, you know, rivers full time. Um, but we don't have that data. And my demand has not been to get rid of vaccines or to say they're bad, but just to say, Let's have the kind of uh, randomized placebo or other evidence, real evidence. You know, randomized placebo tests are not the only good scientific evidence, but any evidence that actually shows that the 
the all, you know, that the health outcomes are better among the people who take the intervention than people who don't. Yes, I, I completely accept and agree with your uh, your improvement to my model. Somebody who does what they think is the right thing, but uh, resists evidence that they are incorrect is a, is a hazard. If they get yeah. it wrong, they can do harm. And so I agree with you. And I also um, aspire to that same that same standard. But in any case, I, I do want to say that I um, not only have you opened my eyes to a number of things, um, but I also just simply appreciate your commitment to doing what is necessary uh, in spite of the cost, because I know they have been tremendous. So um, uh, I regard you as a patriot. I, I know that I'm a patriot and one patriot to another. Uh, I, I appreciate what you have done for us. Thank you. Um, now, there's a lot of uh, preliminary work that I think we need to do to get to the conversation that I hope to have. The conversation ultimately will center around your new book, The Real Anthony Fauci. Now, I must confess, I have tried to read this book. I tried to triage it in advance of this podcast, but there wasn't enough time. And uh, triaging it turned out to be almost impossible because virtually every paragraph contains something jaw-dropping. And so um, I did find it a bit of a slow read, but uh, absolutely captivating. But in any case, when we get to that part of the conversation, I think you're going to have to lead me through it because I didn't get very far um, in advance of our conversation. But I do want to uh, clear something up for, uh, for our viewers and listeners. Um, your voice has a wobble to it. Um, I know there's a story here and I know that you don't uh, like talking about it. And I think I know that that's not because it's personally troubling to you, but your concern uh, is that it will be misinterpreted um, if you talk about uh, where this may have come from. But I think actually it probably makes sense just to clear the air. Um, so what is the wobble in your voice? Well, I, I really don't know where it comes from. I know that I got it. I had a very, very strong voice until 1996. When I was 42 years old, my voice um, got this tremor in it. And um, the, it's, it, it, the disease is called spasmodic dystonia. And I had no inkling. After many, many years, doctors have said to me, did you have some trauma at the time? That Because apparently the onset of this disease, which affects, I don't know how many people, but there's a significant number, maybe 50 or 60,000 people who are affected in this country. Uh, but the onset of the disease um, is often accompanied by trauma. So, what, the, two years ago, I was reading um, a, I was actually, I was preparing a, a racketeering lawsuit against a bunch of vaccine companies, against four vaccine companies that make all 72 of the childhood, the mandatory childhood vaccines that are given to children in this country. And for the first time, I had to go through the manufacturer's insert of every one of those vaccines. When I got to the flu vaccine, I realized for the first time there's 420 side effects listed as vaccine side effects on those inserts. And I had never read them all the way through. When I was doing the flu vaccine section, I saw that many of the flu vaccines listed asthmatic dystonia as one of the side effects, the known side effects. And they have to get... FDA approval to put that side effect on their uh, on their manufacturer's insert. And FDA under federal law has to agree that there's a probability based upon the evidence that that injury is caused by the vaccine. So this was only two years ago. And I've been working on vaccine issues since 2005. And people would ask me, do you have any vaccine injuries in your family or among people who are close to you? And I would say no. Uh, the, for the first time, I recognize that there's a possibility that my injury, the, the, the reason it's a possibility is because at that point in my life, I was teaching at Pace University Law School in White Plains, New York. And right next to my clinic where I taught 
it was the school infirmary. And the infirmary every year would post a sign saying, come get your flu shot. And every year I went in and got my flu shot. Oh, in 1996, I got a flu shot. And I have no idea whether that flu shot caused this condition, but it is uh, now at least a hypothesis. And uh, it's possible that you don't remember the dates well enough, but if you do, the uh, onset of the condition was following the flu shot that year and not too far or something along those lines? Exactly. All right. Well, that's that's fascinating. So it's only in the last couple of years that you've even potentially connected the dots between uh, your voice condition and uh, and vaccines. Now, I must say, I'm also beginning to wonder about something that has affected my life. Um, and that is, as my viewers know, I have a severe wheat allergy, right? The tiniest amount of wheat in something sets off a, a cascade of symptoms. And basically, I until I discovered that I was allergic to wheat, I had, I think, uh, basically continual inflammation. Um, having gotten wheat out of my diet, the inflammation has cleared up. Lots of things I didn't know were symptoms of anything went away and improved the quality of my life dramatically. And when I accidentally get wheat because somebody hasn't been clear on where there is wheat, um, the symptoms come rushing back. So um, I know I have this condition. It's mysterious to me and has been for a long time because my ancestors have been eating wheat for thousands of years. Um, and I had uh, thought I had a model in my mind of um, the there being exposure of things in the gut to uh, elements of the immune system that are not actually supposed to contact the contents of the gut, which regard the food contents as foreign and they fight, right? Basically develop an allergy because a part of your immune system is seeing molecules that it shouldn't. And what I did not <clears throat> understand at the time, I must say, uh, I don't know, and I will ask you shortly um, how you regard yourself, you know, if there is such a thing as an anti-vaxxer and uh, if there are such uh, people, if you are one, but I am certainly, I would say, almost the opposite. I am a huge fan of vaccination. I have lectured on the beauty and elegance of this mechanism, and to this day, I believe it is the most powerful tool in our medical toolkit. However, what I did not realize was that the thing I had been lecturing on, that is to say, the um, borrowing of the immune system, the sending information into the system of B and T cells so that they are alerted in advance of pathogens that one's ancestors have never seen, that mechanism is only part of what goes into a modern vaccine. And there are other elements, for example, uh, these adjuvants. Um, which effectively, uh, they irritate the immune system so that it reacts more strongly so that the vaccine is more effective. And, you know, in principle, sure, that's a great idea. On the other hand, aggravating one's immune system may have arbitrary consequences. And nobody ever told me that, you know, you're getting this vaccine, you should be especially careful about contacting certain kinds of molecules, about other things you might do, because if you in the period, and frankly, I don't know how long the immune system is in this excited state after one is vaccinated, but these, these adjuvants um, have the potential to intervene in arbitrary ways and cause you not only to have a strong reaction to the antigens in a traditional vaccine, but they can also cause you to react to other things that are uh, present in, in your body. Um, so I had not put that together. That means I am now wondering if I might be suffering from a, uh, a, a vaccine adverse event, and I will likely never know. Um, well, there are, you know, it's interesting because if, first of all, there's a lot of potential culprits. And as you know, I did, the, uh, I was on the trial team in the Monsanto case and Monsanto um, was, you know, has this uh, herbicide, which is glyphosate based. And one of the things we know about glyphosate is that it, it interferes with the shikimate pathway, which is the pathway that your microbiome uses to regulate like, immune responses. And um, the in 2006, Monsanto told farmers to start 
spraying glyphosate onto wheat in the, at harvest time as a desiccant to dry out the crop to avoid mold. And that, actually the largest sales of glyphosate, I think about 70% of the sales have occurred since then. And for the first time they were spraying it on food because most of the use of glyphosate is early in the growing season when you're trying to fight weeds before they, you know, allow the corn to grow up above them. It also had never been sprayed on wheat before because they have Roundup Ready corn, but they don't have Roundup Ready wheat, or they, at least they didn't. And so huge amounts of glyphosate were, were sprayed on the corn, on the wheat, and people in our country and around the world began having celiac diseases and gluten allergies um, at a rate beginning in 2006 that we had never seen before. So, there, you know, we're all swimming around in a toxic soup right now, and you can't really pinpoint one culprit and identify that in a, in a an outcome like you have. I will say this, on the vaccine adjuvants, here's what happened. The original vaccines were live virus vaccines. Polio vaccine and and smallpox vaccine. But what happened is that they realized that if you give somebody a live virus vaccine, it can um, it can mutate in your body and your gut, and you can and create a more virulent form of the vaccine. What you're doing is you're giving people a a a um, a, 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 a disarmed version of the virus, so a less virulent form of the virus, which will give you immunity against all forms, including the much more virulent and deadly forms. But the virus, when they use a live virus vaccine, can morph in your body and it can turn into, it can turn pathogenic and virulent and transmissible. And um, for, for example, today, 70% of the polio in the world is vaccine strain. So it's coming from vaccinated individuals. This is what WHO acknowledges. So very early on in vaccinology, the regulatory agencies expressed preference for dead virus vaccines. So you disable the virus, you give a fraction of it, or you kill it and then give it to people. The problem is the dead virus vaccines do not provoke a durable and robust immune response that you need to get a license. And what vaccinologists discovered very early on was that if you add something horrendously toxic to the vaccine, that the body, it kind of shocks the body and the body then remembers the antigen and associates it, associates it with that toxic element. And so there was a search around the world by vaccinologists for the most toxic elements in the universe. And they began adding mercury, which is a thousand times more neurotoxic than lead. And it is the most toxic element in the universe that we know about that is not radioactive. Right. I was going to say plutonium is going to yeah. beat okay. it. But, uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, but then but mercury was discontinued. You got a really bad name was discontinued in most of the American vaccines in 2003, with the exception of the flu vaccine, and it was replaced by aluminum. And you saw, but there was aluminum throughout. What you, what we've seen in this country, the, the vaccine schedule exploded in 1989. We went from the three vaccines that I got as a kid, to the 72 vaccine doses, uh, it's 72 doses of 16 vaccines that my children's generation got. And it happened very quickly, beginning around 1989. And you started seeing these explosions of neurodevelopmental disorders, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism went from one in 10,000 in my generation and your generation to one in 22 boys in our children's generation. Um, food allergies like peanut allergies, also eczema, anaphylaxis, asthma, allergic disease. And then a third category of diseases also became epidemic, the autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile diabetes. And most people think that the 
uh, that the allergic disease we began seeing was a result of the aluminum adjuvant because the aluminum is put in the vaccine to prompt essentially an allergic response, a heightened antibody response. And it turns out that it's not just, you know, there are things like peanut oil excipients in the vaccine itself. So you may get an allergic response to that, but also um, things that are in the ambient environment at that time appear to also get targeted by that response as you just pointed out. So if you have a Timothy weed outbreak the week that you get that vaccine, you may have now a lifetime allergy to Timothy weed. And there's two scientists, uh, one called Callings and another called uh, Anthony Mawson, who have done studies that show that children who are vaccinated have 30 times the rate of allergic rhinitis as children who are not unvaccinated. Now, I had 11 brothers and sisters. I have something like 70 first cousins on both sides. And I didn't know anybody with a food allergy growing up. And yet my children, almost all of my six children have allergies. And so we know that something happened. And when Congress told EPA, what year did, for example, the autism epidemic begin? EPA scientists came back and said it was 1989. And so some, and that's the year that the vaccine schedule exploded. It doesn't mean it's all coming from vaccines because there's other things that happen on that timeline like PFOAs, which are flame retardants, which became ubiquitous. Glyphosate around that time became ubiquitous. Uh, cell phone radiation, uh, ultrasound, neonicotinoid pesticides, and a number of others. So you can't pinpoint one toxin. But as a, it make, vaccines make a very good culprit because of those adjuvants. The adjuvants are designed to give you allergies and allergies suddenly beginning in 1989. It's hard to find somebody prior to 1989 who has a peanut allergy. Right. People, who have, it's pretty easy, like in every classroom, you'll find people. We went um, during, we went from having 6% of Americans having chronic diseases in 1940, by 1986, we had 11.8%, and by 2006, 54%, and the big change happened in 1989. Well, so this actually treads into the uh, the area that, that Heather and my book is focused on, what we call hypernovelty. And I think people need to start thinking about the puzzles about what's wrong with them in a different way, right? It may be, you know, you can have an argument about uh, a particular uh, cause and whether it leads to autism, for example, right? And lots of people can shut down that argument and they can say, well, this doesn't cause autism. We've established that. But the question is, well, then what does? There's something in the environment. If there is an increase in the rate of this disorder, it is implausible that it would be a change in the underlying genes. So it's something that we are allowing to interface yeah. with children. Um, so genes, as you know, genes don't cause epidemics. Genes, right. They may provide the vulnerability, and there are subgroups that are more vulnerable, but you need an environmental toxin. That's just pure science. Right. So there's a, a very, very famous scientist, um, I think he's at Mount Sinai, called Phil Landrigan, and I've actually you know, used him as an expert in, in some of our cases. He's one of the you know, the leading kind of toxicologist in the world. And he has looked at this problem that you're talking about and said, why did all these things happen essentially beginning, you know, in the early 1990s? Why was this, there this huge explosion of chronic disease? Yeah. And he, he came down with 11 suspects. Things that you have to find something that is that became ubiquitous in that period. So it has to be something that affected equally Cubans in Key Biscayne, Miami, and Inuit in Homer, Alaska. Right. And there's only a certain number of <laughs> interventions that occurred during that period that you can blame. But it's an easy it's an easy scientific problem to solve. If, if you we were have the government officials interested in solving if it, if you but, were inclined to solve yeah, it, and it's unfortunately, not. the people who are 
responsible for all of those toxic exposures are also the most powerful lobbying groups in the United States economy and in Washington. Right. So we I don't even know what the description of this problem is, but in some sense, you have a um, the fox inherits the role of guarding the chicken coop. I, I don't know. I'd say that Fox is guarding the Fox coop. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> right. they're, they're <laughs> yeah, it's it's something along these lines. But nonetheless, we, you know, in instance after instance, we play this game where we rule out causes in order to exonerate some group of people that has altered something. And the problem is we don't then go to the next step and say, look, it is something that's causing the uptick. Therefore, we, you know, if you really wanted to address the issue, you would figure out what was doing it. So even if you can't help people who've already been affected, you could prevent it from affecting anybody new. And, and the problem is, Brad, that there's also an entire industry of what we call biostitutes, which are these, you know, phony um, uh, mercenary scientists for hire who can drum up particularly epidemiological studies, which are very, very susceptible to corruption in order to exclude a certain cause. In my uh, racket, which is plaintiff's um, litigation and pharmaceutical litigation and litigation against polluters, we have a saying that, that statistics don't lie, but statisticians do. <laughs> and also there's another saying that uh, that, you know, statistics are like prisoners of war. They'll say anything you want if you torture them enough. And these guys are experts of taking industry money and then torturing data to make it uh, exclude a certain, uh, to, and to exonerate a certain culprit. And so when government officials say, well, um, we have excluded that and we know it's not that. You also need to say, show me the actual study because I don't actually believe anything that you say. And then you need to read that study and you need to read it critically because, as you know, the scientific journals have also been captured by the industry. And when, you know, it's just because something is peer reviewed does right. not mean it's true. You have to read it critically. Right. No, peer review. Well, <laughs> you know, Heather and I sometimes uh, say that uh, peer review is different than review by one's peers, right? <laughs> that these, that we think peer review is just, you know, it's something you can interpret in a straightforward common parlance way. But no, yeah. no, 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 no. It's a very corrupt process. But actually, this leads to. And, and, I, and I don't mean to interrupt no, you. No, you're but fine. I think one of the things that kind of led me to where I am today is I have kind of a unique job, which is, you know, is litigating against powerful polluters that has put me in this niche of um, of of having to study peer reviewed publications and to read them critically. And even the ones that I'm not smart enough to read critically, I need to find somebody who can and say, I suspect they cheated here. Tell me how they did it, you know? And, yep. and so I'm always, you know, I don't automatically believe peer review. And I know that you, that there's certain tricks that they all use and there's gimmicks and there's, you know, the stratification of data and there's exclusionary criteria and all these, uh, these tricks that they use to get any outcome that they want. All right. And I think it's going to be hard for people who haven't encountered it in a professional context to even comprehend what you're getting at. But the fact is, and, you know, this is another place uh, Heather and I say that science is an extremely powerful process, but it's also extremely fragile. Right. In order to get the scientific method to work, it has to be insulated from things like market forces. Market forces completely overwhelm yeah. the scientific method. And what you're saying can be translated as um, any hypothesis can be falsified for a price. Right. If you want yes. to run a study that falsifies the connection between A and B, it can be done. And so the problem is you have to figure out how to exclude studies that are built to do that and leave only studies that actually um, meet the bare minimum requirements of an actual scientific test, which is not easy. You can't always spot it from the oh, outside. And I, you know, the best, kind of, anybody who doubts that that's happening should look at the testimony of people like Richard Horton, who is a scoundrel who 
you know, but a highly respected one who has run the Lancet, I don't know, which is the highest gravitas scientific and medical journal for decades. And he says in it, there is, he says, we have become propaganda vessels for the pharmaceutical industry, that there's basically nothing in our journal that you can believe anymore. Marsha Engel, who was until recently the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, who has written a book saying exactly the same thing. Well, the editors of the highest gravitas, highest weight journals, all of them have acknowledged that what is published in their journals is not necessarily truth, and that more often it isn't truth. It's uh, it's uh, profit-making mercenary propaganda by you know people who have a lot of stake in saying I have a scientifically ratified product, which results in something the public is completely incapable of navigating, which is a world in which basically you have two kinds of cherry picking pitted against each other. You've got the honorable cherry picking where you are trying to get rid of the stuff that isn't right because it was built to fail, right? And you've got the exact opposite in which a false picture is being painted for some purpose you don't necessarily even know. And this is not an environment that is conducive to figuring out what's true, right? Because really then it becomes a question of, you know, who do you trust? And that's not a scientific question, no. right? That's the opposite of science. Right. You know, it's appeals the, to authority is a logical fallacy. Right. Oh, um, you can't do it that way. And that's right. I mean, the, you know, the essential sort of intention of, um, liberal democracy and of science and medicine and even law has been the um, the discernment or the search for existential truths. And, you know, we're all walking around at this point in a wilderness of mirrors, you know, that has been deliberately constructed to lie to us and to deceive us about where the truth actually lies. Right, which, all right, <laughs> I don't even know where to start here, but let me just say, um, your book, it has thrown a certain number of people uh, that I quite respect. These are people who are on the front lines fighting the good fight, who do know this material. And yet in diving into your book, they are thrown because of what they didn't know, right? There is something about the, uh, you know, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but to the extent that I've been into your book, it feels to me like um, a beautifully written indictment, right? So it is in its own way encyclopedic in going through the history of these uh, conclusions, of the history of the people involved in making them and drawing connections. And here's what I'm getting at. I've long been focused on political corruption and capture. I've long been aware that capture is an inadequate term, right? Regulatory capture is too narrow to describe what we see almost anywhere, right? Regulatory capture is really about regulatory agencies that begin to function on behalf of the uh, the sectors that they- They become sock puppets for the industry that they're supposed to be regulating. Right. But that does not cover what we begin to see, right? For the FDA to be um, corrupted by pharma is not surprising. It's tragic, it's dangerous, but it's not surprising. For Google to be in on it is a new twist. And so I don't know what the right term for what we see is. Uh, as a placeholder, I've been saying something like extended capture, right? It's capture of all of the things necessary in order to create uh, what you're describing as a hall of mirrors. Um, I would say it's, a, it's an entirely Potemkin public health narrative. And so before I got to your book, um, I've obviously been uh, talking to Heather and Pierre Corey and, and Robert Malone and, and all of these folks about what we're seeing. And we are all, it's all, it's like we're backstage 
right? We can see the thing happening in front of us. It's not that hard to see if you know where to stand, but the public can't understand what they're seeing. Um, and here's the, the little puzzle that uh, I'm left with. If I look at the public health recommendations for, for COVID, I think that the public health recommendations are the exact inverse of what one would do if one wanted to control this disease and minimize the harm from it. And it's not that they're bad and arbitrary and wrong. It's the inverse, right? You can't get to the inverse through incompetence. That would be impossible, right? You would yeah. get arbitrary from incompetence. What we have is, uh, you know, we have drugs that work early. What's the recommendation? That we don't treat you until very late in the progression of disease, right? When we know that the stuff that we have that works doesn't work anymore, right? Where do we send you? We send you home where you're going to get people who you live with sick, right? All of these things don't make any sense. So we use exactly the things that don't work. Remdesivir doesn't work. It's a dangerous drug that doesn't work. And we use that. We don't use the safe drugs that do work, right? So again, it's the inverse of what you would expect if we were trying to control the pandemic. Now, somebody watching may hear me say that and say, Brett's lost his mind, right? He's got it exactly upside down. And the, I think, uh, you know, an honest broker who's walking into this conversation for the first time has to wonder who has it exactly wrong. Somebody does, right? It could be me, but it could also be you know, Tony Fauci, for example. Now, your book comes at this puzzle. And what it does that um, I think is so valuable is it begins to lead people through how you might end up at a response that was upside down, right? Upside down is a very troubling thing. And it suggests, I mean, what do you do about a, a public health apparatus that's doing the exact inverse of what you're supposed to do. How do you even turn it around, right? It has to go 180 degrees in the other direction in order to be effective. Um, and I don't, I don't even know that there's precedent for that. Um, so I guess it's a hall of mirrors. It's a Potemkin public health response. It's the inverse of what we should do. It creates um, a vast chasm between people who are making sense and people who are not, which makes it much harder for people, you know, to dip their toe in the water and begin to, you know, to listen to the other side. Um, so what do you see? Where are we? Right. You're, you're, you're shocking people with your book. Is there a way out of this? Well, um, that's a huge question that I really don't deal with in the book. What is the way out of this? And, what you know, I think the way that you put this, I, I kind of wish I had some of that language um, in the conclusion of the book because it, it's a way of saying something is really wrong here without actually trying to read people's minds and attributing attribute motives to them. And I tried to avoid that throughout the book. I don't say, here's why, you know, Tony Fauci was scheming to do this. I just show these recurring patterns of behavior that began early on in his career and that again and again and again worked for him. The, the alliances with the pharmaceutical industry, the capacity uh, to control science, to suppress science, to punish scientists who were, you know, publishing a contrary science and to really control the, the, the extraordinary hegemony that he has over global scientific research, not only what gets funded, but also what gets suppressed. Between him and his two partners, Jeremy Farrar, who one runs the Wellcome Trust, and Bill Gates, um, they control 61% of the biomedical research in the world. And they, those three men, have used the same pattern of, of control, of the manipulation of fear, of the um, generation of, um, of fake pandemics. And I'm not saying this one is a fake pandemic because it isn't, uh, but throughout their careers, they've repeatedly faked pandemics. And I show all that in the book. 
Um, and I don't, you know, I, I try not to look into their heads and, you know, and speculate. I just really try to tell, uh, give the facts about what happened. And out of these recurring patterns, you can see that there is something truly wrong. Now, how do we correct that? The, the brief answer to that is we need to fix democracy, which is not a, you know, I mean, the, the problem is, I, you know, I feel like I saw all of this happening beginning because of the nature of my work as an environmental advocate and just being part of the, the family that I'm part of. I saw this trajectory of, of how corporations take control and, you know, execute essentially a coup d'etat against, against democracy. And over a long period of time, and, you know, part of it is... Um, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, getting rid of campaign finance reform and unleashing these huge tsunamis of money that are coming into uh, all of these mechanisms of corruption, including all the well-documented um, mechanisms of agency capture that always are happening in a democracy. Um, but, you know, we've now, we've really now... Uh, I believe, kind of obliterated democracy in our country. And even my party, the Democratic Party, has at red realizes that. And they realize that democracy, I mean, the, the whole theme of the censorship drive, which the Democratic Party, 80% of Democrats now believe that censorship is an okay thing. And that's extraordinary because we all grew up reading Kafka and, you know, Robert Heinlein and, you know, Aldous Huxley and, um, and uh, Solzhenitsyn. And we know that censorship always leads to tyranny. Oh, how, you know, why is it that 80%, 78, 80% of Democrats now endorse it? And what does that mean? What it means fundamentally is that they've lost they've lost faith in democracy. They now believe that the people, the demos, cannot be trusted with information and that the information has to be manipulated, changed, diffused before it's given to them. And that the government ought to be in charge of that process and ought to collaborate with these titans like Mark Zuckerberg and Google to make sure that the population is controlled, which is the opposite of, of democracy. And so, you know, when you ask, how do you fix it? We need to really, um, let, let me go back and say one thing, uh, give a hopeful message, because I don't want to depress everybody. But we lost democracy at another era in American history, which was during the Gilded Age in the 1890s, you know, 1900s, where you had a few of these very, very wealthy, it's very analogous to what we're, what's happening now. You have the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and the Mellons and the Morgans and the Fricks who, who, were, who controlled not only the entire economy, but also at that point there was no direct election of senators and they um and so they were handpicking senators and democracy really disappeared in america and you had what what you had the press that rose up you had these muckraking journalists you had the, the populist movement in the countryside the progressive movement in the cities and you had a very dynamic leader teddy roosevelt who came in and they you know they passed the Sherman Antitrust Act. They forced, um, they had graduated income tax for the first time. They abolished, they created the 40 hour work week. They gave women the vote. They abolished child labor. Um, they gave, they, they allowed unions to actually function and they started, they restored democracy in many ways. Well, I think it can happen. The problem is today, the, the, you know, this is not just tyranny, it's totalitarianism. And what is the difference? Totalitarianism seeks to control the way people think every aspect of your life. And they have, for the first time in history, the capacity for that kind of total control. You know, the Chinese are now using facial recognition systems that can tell whether you look guilty. And, you know, we're seeing these track and trace surveillance now that I think is a really... Um, it's a daunting obstacle to the restoration of democracy. But 
Yeah, well, um, I see the same picture. I, I must say I'm a bit concerned about a couple things. I, I agree it is also it is still possible to rescue democracy and in fact that we don't really have any choice. And um, during the last election, I tried to make this uh, this point. I launched Unity 2020, which was a plan for doing just that. And actually, we, we did quite well. We reached a lot of folks. It obviously wasn't going to turn the election. But um, but nonetheless, I do believe it's possible. I believe it's it's very late, but not too late. Um, on the other hand, I think some new things are stacked against us, and it's very hard to get people to spot them. One of them, I'm watching all sorts of people who understood the problem of authoritarianism when it came to woke ideology. Lots of people who saw through it and did not uh, cotton to the, the authoritarian impulse. They are on a different side with respect to the public health response. They are quite convinced... I think that the lies they are being told are noble lies, and therefore it's time for us all to get on board to get past COVID. And they do not understand there is no plan here to get past COVID. That's not what's being deployed, and they've got it wrong. Those aren't noble lies at all. So even journalists who um, would have been the people I would expect to out the... Uh, whatever this pattern is, and to say this makes no sense, nothing about this is what you would do if you were trying to control COVID, those people have by and large been quiet. And I think they've been quiet because as soon as you step into a scientific milieu, many people who would otherwise have the courage of their convictions um, start uh, cowing to authority because they don't, they don't in, internally feel entitled to challenge uh, things that are patently wrong, right? They feel they, they, they're outranked by someone. So I, I, worry, I worry about that. And I also worry that the nature of the censorship is now, um, maybe it's not even just the censorship, the nature of the tyranny is now much more surgical. And so because there's a lot more capacity to, you know, you don't used to be that if the uh, the intelligence agencies wanted to spy on somebody, it was an effort they had to spend on it, and which meant that they couldn't just spy on everybody. And um, that limited the amount of spying that got done, presumably, just as a practical matter. Now, because we're all transmitting virtually everything through channels that can be uh, just simply captured, it's become impossibly cheap and they don't even need to know who they're spying on. They just collect it all. And then at the point you become trouble, they look into what you've said. They can map your entire social landscape and figure out who you trust, who you don't trust, what your blind spots are, whatever it is they want to know, they can do it. Um, which means. And then they can punish you instantly by cutting off your money, your cell phone, all of the, you know, the, without any kind of due process or trial or even right. uh, regulatory involvement. They can tell you don't travel. They can deny you access to your job, to your education, to ba basic rights are now rewards for compliance and obedience rather than, you know, the rights that you can't take from me no matter what. They're right now, uh, they're now all on. The, they're just they're they're cookies that you give you for, that they give you for you know uh, for demonstrating obedience. Right, which means that um, they have a great deal more leverage over those people who would stand up and say no. People like you, um, right? You are being ruthlessly punished for disagreeing. And I think it will be any honest broker who listens to this conversation or any other conversation that you've had will hear a careful, thoughtful person who is trying to make sense out of a complex, um, a complex crisis, right? Um, but the point is, for somebody who doesn't know what you think, I haven't looked at your Wikipedia page, but I would guess that there's a lot of colorful stuff on it, as there is on my Wikipedia page. Stuff designed to cause anybody who might be tempted to listen to you to back away because they don't want to get near the um, the social contagion that comes from the various stigmas and epithets that are directed your way. Um, in any case, my, my overarching point is 
the modern tools have made it possible to prevent change much more surgically, which leaves most people unaware that this force that prevents change is is doing this right because it has far more information and it has far it has as you point out all sorts of mechanisms to reward and punish um those that it wants to and i i worry we're gonna have to think our way around that puzzle in order to to make change and we have to make change because we're obviously i mean as you point out it would appear that even the democratic party has um lost faith in the idea of um of democracy and uh the consent of the governed and frankly rule of law and everything else um i guess i do have to ask you i'm also a lifelong democrat do you do you have any hope left for the party um well i i don't think that we can win without you know getting a substantial part of the people a number of the people who are now subsumed in the orthodoxy of Democrats who are subsumed in the orthodoxy who are well-intentioned um, uh, uh, but just don't see it and we those people if we're going to win this battle we need to wake them up and one of the things that I really try to do in my communications is to avoid the polarization is not to point my finger at this party or that party or that race or you know vaccinated versus unvaccinated, all the way, all the mechanisms that you, they use to divide us, which I believe are strategic in order to protect, you know, the, uh, the vested interests and the elites. And we need to stop um, fighting with each other. And uh, I think we need to turn, you know, the Democratic Party around. And it's not, I mean, it's really stunning, Brett, what's happened, the, the attack that the outright coup d'etat against democracy and against constitutional governance that's happened in the past 20 months because we've seen, you know, James Madison put the, said that Jefferson and, and Adams and the other framers put the First Amendment and put freedom of speech and expression into the First Amendment because all of the other amendments depend on it. And we saw them immediately go after the First Amendment. In fact, in October of 2019, when the virus was already almost certainly circulating in Wuhan, um, they had this, you know, this pandemic um, uh, uh, tabletop simulation in New York called uh, called uh, uh, Event 201. And where they, where they, uh, they did a, you know, they did a simulation of a coronavirus, a global coronavirus pandemic. This is a time when it was Bill Gates, it was April Haynes, the former deputy director of the CIA, uh, pharmaceutical people, John Johnson and Johnson, people from the, the uh, from the uh, social media and from the mainstream media, and they're all sitting around a table simulating what's going to happen if a coronavirus pandemic hits it's pr quite extraordinary but the response that they're talking about has nothing to do with a medical response it's all about using the pandemic for a very militarized response and a monetized response to use the pandemic as an excuse to clamp down totalitarian controls and, the, and they spend the entire four session anybody can go and look at this you know it's still on youtube and they spend, you know, a two-hour discussion talking about how to so how to censor social media when people start saying that the coronavirus was laboratory generated. And you have the head of Chinese CDC, George Gao, there. You have the CIA, the, the person who is now Obama's highest spy, the head of the National Security Agency, and that's what they're all talking about. Oh, and as soon as the pandemic came, that's the first thing they did is they started censoring everybody. Well, once they did that, and what Madison said is the reason they put it in the First Amendment is because once you give license to a government to silent speech, the government has a license to commit any atrocity, including abolishing all the other amendments. So then they got rid of the, you know, the other part of the First Amendment is freedom of religion. 
They shut down the churches for a year without due process, without any science being shown, without any public hearings, no notice and comment rulemaking. And they kept the liquor stores open as essential businesses. So, you know, which I don't have an objection. A lot of people, liquor stores are essential, but liquor stores are not in the Constitution and churches are. So there should have been some public national discussion of that and some science demonstrating that this was something that was going to work. And they shut down jury trials. They said the Sixth and Seventh Amendment, Seventh Amendment says, no American shall be denied the right of a trial before his peers in cases or controversies exceeding $25 in value. Well, they passed the PrEP Act and the CARES Act that said if a vaccine company or any other corporation that says it's involved in countermeasures injures or kills you, no matter how negligent they are, no matter how reckless, no matter how grievous your injury, you cannot sue them. They got rid of property rights. They closed a million businesses with no due process, no just compensation. They got rid of all, all of the prohibitions against warrantless searches and seizures, you know, with all this track and tracing surveillance that they implemented. And they got rid of due process and law of law. They, government is no longer by public hearing and, you know, notice and comment rulemaking and you show me the science and I'll cross-examine you and you cross-examine me. It's just one doctor who's saying, put on masks, uh, you know, lockdown without any scientific justification, no argument. And that is so frightening and so disconcerting to, I think, anybody who understands how democracy, they got rid of every amendment except the Second Amendment, which is the guns. The rest of them are all gone. Right. <laughs> um, so, all right. So <laughs> they got rid of it all. One doctor. What are the chances that that doctor would also be one of two people who appears potentially to have been responsible for the pandemic in the first place? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question. And, um, you know, I have a chapter in the book about I have a couple of chapters that are, um, you know, about uh, how Dr. Fauci ended up doing these gain of function experiments. And what happened is that the, I mean, if you go back just historically, and I'll make this very brief, when I was a kid, so you're going to think this is a long story, but when I was <laughs> seven years old, uh, President Eisenhower made what is today probably the greatest speech in America, most important speech in American history where he warned Americans against the uh, obliteration of democracy if we allow the military industrial complex uh, to continue to expand, to emerge and, and dominate you know, democracy. My uncle took over as president three days later. I was at that inauguration. He spends his three years fighting the military industrial complex, dies. My father runs five years later um, running against the military industrial complex, the Vietnam War. He dies during that campaign. And then in 89, and you see the expansion with Nixon coming in and, you know, the military getting more and contractors get, taking more and more control of American democracy. In 89, the communism collapsed and we're all told we're going to get a peace dividend. And, you know, that. The money that went into that billion dollar stealth bomber that cannot fly in a rain in the rain. Okay, that, that that billion dollars is now gonna go to schools and hospitals and roads and you know and healthcare and improving quality of life. And we're all saying this is gonna be great. We're gonna pound the weapons into plowshares. But there were people in our you know, in the, who were like listening to that and saying that's coming out that piece of evidence is coming out of my pocket. So ninety three, four years later, we have the first terrorist attack, and there's a screeching halt. All that money that was headed towards civilian uses now it goes into terrorism, Islamic terrorism. And it gives us justification to be have bases and, you know, 670 bases and 
countries across the world and all of this, you know, this global hegemony. But Islamic terrorism has a problem because it's hard to justify these huge allocations of our GNP to a harm or potential risk that kills fewer people every year, Americans every year, than lightning strikes. And when the World Trade Center attack occurred in 2001, three weeks later, there was an anthrax attack. And that, and our country, you know, first Bush and then Obama, said that declared officially, official documents, that biosecurity is now the spear tip of American foreign policy. And germs are much more appealing than Islamic terrorism because germs can get into everybody's home and they can kill you. And people have a natural repugnance to, to germs. And it's easy to exploit that fear to get them to give up their constitutional rights and to turn this into a national security state ruled by the people that Eisenhower warned us against. So Fauci was part of that. You know, the anthrax attack was used as the justification to, to invade Iraq. It turned out, we found out later, that the anthrax came from one of three U.S. military labs. It was somebody in the U.S. military that was associated, and it had nothing to do with Saddam. But the military began and people who were involved in biowarfare began funneling huge amounts of money into biowarfare. It's illegal. In 72, we signed the treaty. We closed all of our biowarfare labs. Nixon signed the treaty saying we're never going to do it again. We're not never going to, we're not going to create them. We're not going to study them. We're not going to uh, use them and we're not going to, to store them. Bioweapons. So the military wanted to do bioweapons research, but it was scared to because of the legal violations. And so they started taking this money and funneling it to NIH and specifically Tony Fauci. So beginning in 2001, immediately after those attacks, he began receiving $1.6 billion a year or to do essentially bioweapons research. There's a loophole in the bioweapons treaty that says you, the, you can do bioweapons research as long as it's what they call dual use. So as long as you can say you're developing vaccines, you can develop bioweapons. And Tony Fauci had a personal stake in this. They gave him a payoff which is they gave him, when the Pentagon gave him that money, he also got a 68% pay raise that is attached to his bioweapons research. Tony Fauci today is the highest paid official in the U.S. government. He gets $434,000 a year. The president gets only $400,000. It was the next biggest Oh, and why does he get that? He gets almost 70% of it comes from his military work. So he is tied. He has a $6.1 billion budget, of which is money just that he just gives away to scientists to do, you know, to do basically drug development. And then he has an additional $1.6 billion. So it's, uh, it's about $7.7 .7 billion altogether. It comes from the military, and that he had to justify by doing these gain-of-function studies. And, you know, at first it was completely unregulated. He really, and I talk in the book about how he manipulated the regulation and got controls of the committee that were supposed to be overseeing him by putting his grantees on those committees. And he began, and then in a bunch of the bugs escaped in 2014, and 300 scientists signed a letter to Obama saying, you got to stop essentially Tony Fauci from making any more of these bugs. And that year he began transferring his studies to the Wuhan lab because the Chinese were welcoming them and the Chinese were, and Wuhan lab is run by the Chinese military. You cannot work in that lab without some association with the Chinese military. And the Chinese military are very frank that what they're doing is weapons development. 
And so you had all this this group of characters, very you know interesting and uh, um, people like Ralph Barrick from the University of North Carolina and uh, Peter Dayzak, who had their own self interest at and made excuses to themselves that they were you know doing the I mean listen. Tony Fauci is saying it out of the corner of his mouth. He's saying we're doing this in order to develop vaccines as countermeasures. The people who know most about this area, like Mark Lipsitch of Harvard and um, and Richard E. Bright and all of, uh, a bunch of others, say there's not a single development that has come out of gain of function research that has helped in any pandemic, including this one, is worthless research. But Tony Fauci himself was funding Ralph Barrick to create um, these legation processes where you not only are developing these pandemic superbugs, but you're also developing methodologies for hiding the fact that they were bioengineered. Oh, the noceum edits. The noceum edits. Oh, and the interesting thing about that is how do you justify them? Why in the world, why is that a benefit to public health? Why, right, right. under what baby, <laughs> and Fauci was funding that. Right, and, you, 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 would, know, you would in fact want the exact opposite because you would, you want, would want the ability to at least know when something you had done exactly had caused, caused a harm. Um, yeah, that's that's incredible. And I mean, again, I, I, I just think people, okay, you, you've got, two narratives. One is we're doing the best we can. It's the unvaccinated who are causing this pandemic to go on and on. And we've got the tool at our disposal and people just need to use it. Okay. That's obvious nonsense, but nonetheless, that's the story. Um, and then you've got the alternative narrative, which is actually the vaccines, interesting as they are as a technological discovery, have multiple design failures within them. They are weak as can be, which anybody, you don't need any biological knowledge whatsoever to recognize that if they've faded to the point you need a booster in six months, this isn't much of a vaccine by any standard, right? So- But also, there's no pretense that they prevent transmission. Right. So, oh, and it's this incredible cognitive dissonance, this incredible intellectual discontent that people, your friends, are telling you, you can't come to my party because you're unvaccinated. And you can't even say to them, but the vaccines, but Tony Fauci says, vaccines don't prevent transmission. Right. And you can tell somebody that fact, and the reaction will be to get furious at you rather than say, oh, um, and how am I protected? We know that vaccinated people are equally likely from all the data that we have to pass the illness to you. They may, you know, there's a lot of data that says if you're vaccinated, you're more likely. Yep. Well, I can't say that's true because um, we do not have, because nobody's, you know, funding the science to show that. But the science that we have and also common sense. And this is what Luke Montaniero, who discovered, you know, won the Nobel Prize for discovering the HIV virus in 1993. And what he said from the beginning, if you if you vaccinate people with a, what they call a leaky vaccine, which is a vaccine that does not prevent transmission during the height of a pandemic, you are turning every vaccinated person into a mutant factory. You're actually it's a. <laughs> Each person is a uh, a serial passage gain of function experiment. Exactly. De facto. For the same reason that subtherapeutic antibiotics, right? Exactly. Generate um, generate uh, antibiotics resistant superbugs. Yep. A vaccine that is subtherapeutic is going to is by every from anybody who understands natural selection or biological evolution would immediately say, of course, that is going to create mutant superbugs. Right now. And they've played this game. They've played it with me and I don't much like it because they accuse me of not understanding what I'm talking about. When in fact, what they're doing is just playing a linguistic game. We say escape mutants, right? That puts the emphasis on mutation. And so they make this argument that the number of cases is is proportional to the amount of mutation, which is of course true, but it's the selection for the mutants that are resistant 
to these vaccines that is driving this. So the, they, these are escape variants, which is the result of selection, which is very definitely happening in those who have been vaccinated. What's more, and this is, again, very hard to convey to people who haven't been paying attention, but COVID is not the worst disease it might be from the point of view of the symptoms, but it's very bad on its own. Right. It does damage to many different types of tissue. It does tax all organs, right? Essentially. All organs, which I take to be indicative, actually, of the likely origin from the lab, because most bugs have to pay attention to, you know, keeping you on your feet. So you spread them. But in a laboratory, things are very different if you're spreading it in a tissue or in an animal that doesn't have to forage. Right. It can. Right. It can. You, if, if you are a pathogen and. You want your host to be eating, drinking, having sex, going to parties. Right. Um, and, and because you, the advantage goes to the ones that are not sickening every organ in their host. Right. So this is a bad disease. And Heather and I have said that from the beginning. This is a dangerous disease. Yeah. Those who downplay it were making a mistake. The irony is that this has actually changed. This was a very dangerous disease until some very good, dedicated doctors figured out how to treat it, right? It is now a very manageable disease, except for the fact that all of the tools that would prevent it and are useful in treating it are being removed from the table as quickly as possible. And so the idea that, you know, it isn't one, you know, yes, ivermectin, indeed, there's a really good drug that works really well in this case. We know that from doctor's clinical experience, likewise, hydroxychloroquine. But even if you take those off the table, we still have a whole host of substances that work. And we actually, in fact, have substances that prevent people from coming down with it. And yet our public health response does not include a discussion of things like vitamin D and zinc and magnesium, right? This is unconscionable, right? We are actually talking about a disease that at great cost, we have learned how to deal with. It does not require us to lock down the world at this moment because we have enough knowledge, but we're not deploying it. And so what they've effectively left us is a vaccine that is effectively an interesting prototype, right? not nearly well enough understood, not nearly safe enough to be deployed into the public, not justified on the basis that it doesn't, uh, as you point out, prevent transmission, right? We have this prototype vaccine being deployed as if it's a solution to the pandemic and the actual solutions are being uh, kept out of play. And that is keeping this disease much more dangerous than it actually is or would need to be at this point. This is preposterous. It's the up, upside down inverse public health response. And the problem, I mean, really, let's let's talk about the actual problem. The actual problem is if what I just said is true, then the world is upside down. That leaves the person watching this podcast with nothing to grab onto. OK, so there are some renegades who say we're doing the exact inf inverse of what we should be doing. Even if you would acknowledge that, it doesn't tell you how you change anything. So, you know. At least I think people are simply doubling down on the idea that the public health authorities must be doing the right thing, yeah. because if, if they're not, it's hopeless. Yeah. And it's hard. You, you know, you discredit yourself and marginalize yourself if you even by inventorying all the like bad things they do, because the the. Um, the conclusion that you kind of corral yourself into is feeling like they, you know, a lot of evidence that they're deliberately doing things that they know are wrong to harm public health. And, you know, that's for most people, that's um, it's impossible to believe. I when I was um, studying law later, when I was teaching litigation, one of the things that we always, that I taught, you know, my students when they're talking to a jury, you never tell the jury that all doctors are wrong about this. You you really target it to that doctor because the jury does not want to believe all doctors are wrong. They want to believe something's wrong with that doctor who you're suing. And I think it, it just is it's unacceptable to people that, at these, you know, that these medical officials who are 
who are in charge of our lives may have uh, bad motivations. And I don't even go into that in my book because I try to stay away from the motive, but I do lay out this very damning case. You and I talked uh, earlier today about what happened in China, and we don't really know but why, how the Chinese were able to deal with this, uh, this pandemic so quickly. They eliminated it by April. So, you know, April 2020. So they had a two month pandemic and it was gone. And um, but we know that the Chinese did exactly the opposite of what we did. If they they did really tracking and tracing, which is they figured out who was infected and they immediately isolated them. And then they gave them early treatment and they had by April, they had published an early treatment protocol which included chloroquine, which is a form of hydroxychloroquine, cousin of hydroxychloroquine, and it, and it included all kinds of herbs that have kerosene in it, and them and zinc and vitamin D, all the things that we know work, and many, many others, and you know, and antibiotics and anti-inflammatories and all the things that you have to do to, uh, to deal with this multifaceted disease. And we did the opposite. This goes to your um, your supposition that we did the inverse of what you're supposed to do. The Chinese took people who were sick and immediately treated them, even if they didn't have any symptoms. Tony Fauci, his procedure was if you came in and you got a positive test, they sent you home to infect your family and to get yourself so sick that you couldn't breathe and then come into the hospital and get remdesivir, which is deadly, so deadly that it was pulled in 2019 from a study on Ebola because it was killing so many people, more than the, the four other drugs. And this was Tony Fauci's study. And the, the, uh, the, the safety review board said, you cannot give this to Ebola victims because it's too dangerous. And now this is the only drug that we have, you know, other than monocloidal. Um, antibodies is the only approved drug for COVID, and it is one of the most dangerous drugs. And also, the, the lethality of that drug mimics COVID. So it's kidney collapse, it's lung collapse, you know, it's pulmonary injury. So people don't know whether it's the drug killing them or the COVID. And to get ventilators, right? So that Tony Fauci's prescription is wait at home in terror. Till you're too, you're so sick that you're not getting enough oxygen in your blood. Come to the hospital and we're going to give you remdesivir, which is deadly, and ventilators, which are deadly. The Chinese did the opposite. They said, as soon as we know you're sick, we're getting you out of the population so you can't infect other people. We're going to give you treatment so you never have to go to a hospital. And, you know, that what we did is the opposite of quarantine. Right. It is the exact opposite of what everybody who has done epidemic management in the history of medicine, who knows that you quarantine the sick, you do not quarantine the healthy. Yeah. Well, not only we <laughs> we quarantined the healthy and, and then, then we, we sent the sick home to them. We sent the sick home and then we nuked the economy so that everybody's sitting at home. To get infected, right? It it is it is it is literally the exact opposite of 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 what you would do reasonably. And even if somehow that was an accident, at the point that it didn't work, and we racked up extremely high levels of mortality for this disease, we should have realized, hey, something we're doing is wrong. And we knew from the beginning that this was a this was an indoor ailment. Yep. The people who were locked in, you know, in senior centers, elder care homes. It raged through those areas and killed everybody. Yep. And um, and so you know why? And, and we don't see it spreading outdoors. Right. So it. so what so do we do? Why we, do we lock everybody we, inside? We closed the beaches, right? We closed <laughs> yeah. the 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 parks. We 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 give thousand dollar tickets to surfers, <laughs> right? Who are in the sun getting vitamin D? Yes, Heather and I were yelling about this. It's like, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, at some level, they caused us to view the entire world as dangerous when 99% of the world was safe. 
right? By masking the healthy, and I must say, this is one of the places I did get wrong. I initially thought masks were likely to work. I masked before almost anyone in my community. In fact, I developed a reputation at the hardware store as we were preparing for lockdown and building our studio. I would go in there masked and they uh, started referring to me as the bandit um, because I had a bandana on. These things don't actually work nearly as well as people think they do. In fact, the cloth masks probably don't work at all. But nonetheless, all right, I got that one wrong. But well, what are we doing? We're putting masks on everyone, all of the healthy people, which creates this ever-present reminder, right? And I think actually you do talk about this in your book, that there is the psychological aspect of um, to the extent that we have two, we have two diseases. One is covid and the other is authoritarianism. Yeah. yeah, right. And so that authoritarian thing depends on people feeling frightened and feeling, uh, you know, uncertain about each other. Right. The whole idea pandemic of the unvaccinated. That was nonsense. Yeah, and the masks are amplifiers for fear. Right. They cause you. The point is, if you were if we were to view this disease as it actually is. The answer is you step outside your door into the outside world, you have become very nearly safe, right? To the extent that you wish to interact with other human beings and you do it in that outside environment, you are very nearly safe. And that ought to be a tremendous relief. It gives us a loophole in this disease that we can exploit to retain our humanity and to interact with each other in normal ways by doing so. And, you know, maybe you would interact at home before and you find a way to interact outdoors now and it gives you normalcy. And the thing is, just as we are doing the wrong thing medically and epidemiologically to control this disease, we are also doing the wrong things socially. Right. We are amping up people's fear and irrationally so. And there's no excuse for it, but it's all part of, hey, if it would be a good idea, we're going to do the opposite, right? Uh, and, you know, if another thing in pandemic management, you want to reduce stress on people. You don't want to say you no longer have a job. You don't want to say that, you know, we're not going to let you see your parents. We're not, we're going to, we're going to remove you. We're not going to allow you to make facial expressions. We're not going to allow you to kiss your children or children to get to hug each other at school. You don't want to, you know, all of the responses, you never saw Anthony Fauci act like America's doctor. I'm kind of getting up the way Roosevelt wouldn't say, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That fear is the enemy. Yeah. And don't be scared. Let's act rationally. Let's take care of each other. Let's have a medical response. Let's make it, let's make sure everybody has access to vitamin D. Let's tell people to get outside to exercise, to lose weight, to avoid chemical residues in your food, to avoid sugar drinks, to uh to do all of the things that you would want a doctor. And then and then, if you ask, what should Tony Fauci have done? The first thing he should have done is to create, there's 11 million, between 11 and 15 million doctors in the world. Many of them working on the front line with COVID patients. How do you create a communication grid that connects all those people so that if somebody in India or Tanzania is having extraordinary success. How do you measure that? How do you calibrate it? And how do you communicate that back to an analytics center? All of these guys, Gates and Larry Ellison and the Google people, why weren't we creating that network grid? We did figure, the opposite. To figure out what is the best existing therapeutic drugs are treating these diseases. Where are people showing us, publishing every day in real time, the best treatment protocols, They instead they did the opposite. They kept us from accessing those treatment protocols they had. You know, Burks, Redfield, Fauci on the stage every day doing these, you know, these press conferences. None of those people ever treated a COVID case. Right. So we were getting our information um, people who had no experience treating these cases, all the frontline doctors who were treating thousands of patients and getting different results. 
Why weren't we distilling that information and you know gathering it, collecting it, distilling it, aggregating it, and then turning it into useful treatment protocols that you could you know update every single day? To this day, Tony Fauci has never published a treatment protocol, early treatment of COVID. The Chinese did it by the end of March, and they had obliterated the disease by April. It, you're 100% right that we should have had doctors networking to figure out what worked, right? That could have very quickly generated very high quality information. And again, it's not even that we didn't do it. We literally did the opposite, right? We are now demonizing. Suppressing and demonizing and marginalizing and vilifying. Right, we are vilifying the very doctors who figured out how to do it. In fact, I don't know that I'm at liberty to say who, but um, I was told of a doctor who has had excellent success with early treatment of COVID who has literally been forbidden by his hospital to prescribe the drugs that he knows work. And he is now being forced to attend effectively the slow deaths of patients he knows he could save. Oh. Right? This is preposterous, right? And, you know. And I know the doctor that you're talking about in Virginia, I think, and I mean, if it's the right one, but. He, um, you know, he's one of the most published and respected doctors in his field in America and was and has a track record of saving lives, of having a infection fatality rates that are a quarter, a third or a fifth of what all of his colleagues have because he's been doing these early treatments. This is the doctor you want. Exactly. That's the doctor you want. And he, you know, in, in Massachusetts now, they're. They're, um, they're illegalizing prescriptions for ivermectin for any purpose. Yep. To keep people from getting life-saving medications. And, you know, you look at this and say, how are they orchestrating this? Yeah. And oh. I, I, it, I, okay. You and I don't know what drives the individuals who are making these bad decisions, but you don't yeah. really need to. Right. At the point that you discover, hey, this looks like the inverse of a good protocol. Um, there's a conspicuous. I've noticed the following pattern. There are lots of doctors who uh, will argue that something like ivermectin is ineffective. And there are lots of other doctors who will say it's effective. I have yet to encounter the doctor who, who has prescribed it, who says it's ineffective. Right. You've got a lot of people who are effectively armchair doctoring who will swear to this one thing, but all of the people who have tried it seem to find it's effective. Now, I, I don't know if I say that here on this podcast, or is there going to be a race? Is there a price point to generate a doctor who will swear he's tried it and it doesn't work? I don't know, but I have yet to see that pattern at all. So at the point you discover that the doctors that do have good track records are using various things um, that are being there's obviously a massive campaign to shape public opinion around these medications. Um, at the point you discover all that's happening, and then you spot that the person who is in charge of our response also happens to be one of two people who are plausibly um, causal of the pandemic, who seems to have circumvented actually federal law and gain of function research and offshored it to a lab that appears to have leaked this pathogen into the world. How is it that a person who appears to be important in the causal chain of this pandemic and is now uh, apparently mismanaging it at the level of not just incompetence, but inverting the best protocols, you don't need to know what's on his mind. You just need to fire him. He just needs to go. Right. It would be hard to do worse than we are doing. And, um, you know, that doesn't require us to know anything beyond uh, where these. I mean, what am I trying to say? If your public health officials aren't even recommending vitamin D this far into this pandemic, then there's no excuse. 
we could replace them with any one of a number of people and instantly improve our response to this. And our failure to do it suggests that something isn't interested in controlling uh, the disease. Yeah, there is a very um, uh, powerful orthodoxy that has, uh, that has compromised the essential intention of some of the key institutions in our democracy, the, uh, the institutions that are supposed to serve the public interest and public health, um, are, have now been subverted in this, you know, in a way that really is a, a kind of coup d'etat against democracy. And it's you, you can see the people who are involved in fortifying the orthodoxy. It's clearly the pharmaceutical companies who are making a lot of money. It's the uh, it's the internet titans who you know there's been a, a transfer in wealth of the latest figures I've seen of three point eight trillion dollars from middle class to the super rich. There's a handful of billionaires who are mainly the Silicon Valley billionaires and media moguls who are making. Uh, on the lockdown are making billions, are amplifying their wealth in these incredible ways. And, and nobody's saying, well, they're also the ones who are censoring any criticism or questions of the lockdown. And then, um, you know, there are other sort of institutions that are involved in the captive agencies that are, have, have long ago been co-opted by uh, the pharmaceutical paradigm, and uh, and then the mainstream media, which you know the the pharmaceutical companies. America, uh, there's two countries in the world that allow direct consumer advertising by pharmaceutical companies, and this is one of the elements that has really facilitated the takeover of these, you know, uh, the fortification of this orthodoxy. Oh, Pharma uh, spends about $9.6 billion in advertising directly to consumers. There's all, The only other nation is New Zealand. Every other nation says, no, pharmaceutical companies can't advertise on TV. Are you out of your mind? Because we know what they're going to do. They're going to create you know, demands for drugs that people don't need. And it's predictable. We use three times the amount of drugs that the average Western nation uses, we pay the highest price for pharmaceuticals in the world, and we have the worst health outcomes in the developed world. And I think we're 79th, you know, they're different indicia like, um, like uh, infant mortality, but we're at the bottom for everything. And when I was a kid, America had the best health system in the world. Now we have the worst in the Western world. And Tony Fauci, over 50 years, has supervised the, de supervised the decimation of American medical system by healthcare system by essentially turning it over to the pharmaceutical industry. What he's done, and this is what people need to understand with his agency, is he has transformed that agency into an incubator for pharmaceutical products. So it used to be that the reason that the National Institute for Allergic and Infectious Disease was launched was to establish the etiology of infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, and allergic diseases, and try to figure out how to cure them and or how to stop them, how to prevent them. And so We've had under his watch, we've had this explosion in chronic disease. The chronic diseases he's meant to, pre to prevent have gone from 6% of affecting 6% of Americans to affecting at least 54% of Americans as of 2006. And so what is he doing with all this money? Here's what he's doing. He's developing drugs to sell to Americans with the pharmaceutical companies. And this is how the system essentially works. He has laboratories where NIH and NIAID scientists test molecules in petri dishes 
that are filled with viral cultures. So he'll have Coxsackie virus and dengue virus and Zika virus and Ebola and and uh, coronavirus and flu viruses in thousands of petri dishes. And they'll drop molecules. This is a simplification of you know of, of what happens. And they'll drop molecules, certain innovative molecules into that petri dish and see if it kills the virus. If it kills the virus, they now have an antiviral, but they have to make sure that it won't kill the person. So they give it to rats and see, or other you know lab animals and see if it kills them. And if ideally it will kill the virus, but it won't kill the rats. So now they have a potential drug. So now they farm it out to a college to a university, and this is how he really has the whole system rigged that people have to understand. He has, there's a group, a class of scientists that are called principal investigators. And the people that you see on CNN every night, Peter Otez, Art Kaplan, Paul Offit, you know, Stanley Perlman, all of the people who represent themselves as experts, they're not independent experts. They're almost all of them are principal investigators who are who rely for their livelihood on grants from NIH. They're usually powerful individuals at a university like Harvard or Baylor or Columbia or Stanford and at the medical school. They'll be the dean of the department, the chair of the department or a dean, and they're the ones who are bringing all the money into that school because the big money now in medicine is in clinical trials. So that drug that Tony Fauci's developed at his lab, he now sends over to one of those PIA, PIs to do uh, phase one trials. So they'll have 50 or 100 humans that they give it to. And, and NIH will give that the PI, the principal investigator, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per subject for every patient they recruit for the trial. The PI gets twenty thousand. The university skims off fifty to seventy-five percent of that. So now you have the university that's on the hook, right? That can be controlled because they're making their money from Fauci's, you know, grants. And it goes to phase two, and sometime between phase two and phase three, when you have maybe 20,000 subjects and huge amounts of money, they now transfer the patent to a pharmaceutical company. So they'll bring in Gilead or Johnson & Johnson or Merck or Sanofi or Pfizer. And that company now share partners with NIH and with the university in completing that study. And Tony Fauci can keep part of the patent for his agency. He can distribute patents to his loyalists within the agency who he favors, who are allowed to get, who are allowed to own part of the patent of any drug they work on if Tony Fauci okays it. And they can get $150,000 a year in royalties for life. So with the Moderna vaccine, he's given either four or six of his top deputies these royalty rights. So they're going to make 150 grand a year. He's got 50% of that patent for NIH. So it's going to make billions. The university that worked on it is gets a part of the patent. And so they can make potentially billions, hundreds of millions, and the PI gets gets a piece of it. So you have this whole system where now he controls the university. So um, so what happens is, and and here's how powerful he is, how much influence that has. Between 2009 and 2016. There were over 200 drugs approved by FDA. Most of the drugs approved during that area, during that era, that all came out of Tony Fauci's shop. So that is how deeply embedded he is in the pharmaceutical industry. He doesn't do public health. He does drug development. That's his job. If you ask Tony Fauci, are Americans uh, healthier since you came in, he's not going to tell you that. He, he doesn't know. He is not 
looking at that metric. He's looking at how many people got vaccinated, how many people got, you know, this drug or that drug. And, um, and you know, the, so the, the, and the metrics by which people, so with the other eight, and, and let's say, here's how he controls the science. Let's say there's a young scientist, a young professor, associate professor at, um, at Stanford or Baylor who says, hey, there's a Kaiser permanent, there's a Kaiser HMO database that has 200 patients in it for 20, year, 20 years of data on 200 patients. And they have all the vaccination records for every one of them down to the batch number. And they have all of the health claims for diabetes, for EpiPens, for allergies, et cetera. I could go in there and do a cluster analysis and see <laughs> whether any of these batches or vaccines are associated with a greater risk or incident for the illnesses. Genius idea, easy to do. And so he proposes that, well, Immediately, the dean of his medical school is going to get a call from uh, Hugh Auchincloss or Cliff Lane or one of uh, Fauci's deputies who tell him, if you let that clown do this study, you know, <laughs> you're going to lose $300 million next year and we're going to bankrupt you. So, you know, nothing gets done. Anything that is going to challenge his worldview, any science just doesn't get done. And these three guys... Jeremy Farrar, who was part of the cover-up at Gain of Function, Bill Gates and Fauci control 61% of the biomedical research in the world. So research does not get done unless it's going to benefit a pharmaceutical company. It's all been turned over. And then you have agencies. You look, I, I've known about agency capture my whole life. Probably 20% of the cases that I brought when I was running Waterkeeper Alliance and, and running the litigation clinic at Pace were against EPA or state health agencies like DEC in New York, probably 20 to 30%. I wasn't suing polluters. I was suing the agency who was making the illegal sweetheart deals with the polluters to allow them to pollute. Oh, I've known about agency capture my, you know, my whole career. I've been for 40 years. I've been suing captive regulators. But when I started doing the vaccine work in 2005, I've never seen anything like this because FDA gets 50% of its budget between 40 and 50% every year from the pharmaceutical industry. CDC has a $12 billion budget. And 4.9 billion of that, so you know, about 40 percent, is goes to buying vaccines and then distributing them. So they're a vaccine company. The way you get promotions, raises, salary evaluations, bonuses at CDC is by showing that you helped with vaccine uptake. And NIH, CDC owns 57 vaccine patents. NIH owns over a thousand patents and makes money on the sales of drugs that it's supposed to regulate. So it's like, it, this is agency capture on steroids. It's like if EPA was making 50% of its budget, you know, from, from coal company revenues, that's the same thing that we'd be dealing with. This is, a, this is an agency that no longer has any interest in public health. It's completely about expanding the profit and revenues of the pharmaceutical industry who are its patrons. So I believe I understand what you just told me. Some of it's very familiar to me. Some of it's new. Um, it appears to be a an environment in which corruption evolves. That's the thing. It's, it's actually adaptation yeah. in a Darwinian sense that enlarges yes. the capture. So the thing that you and I are familiar with from 25, 30 years ago about regulatory capture has evolved into some 2.0 or 3.0 version of that, which is much more elaborate. But it does make sense then of the inverse public health response. Because the thing is, to the extent that humans get control of COVID, it shuts down this brand new gigantic market for pharmaceutical products. And so 
should something in that evolved environment recognize that the interest, the long-term interest of the pharmaceutical companies at the level of their financial well-being involves uh, keeping this disease um, around and frightening and therefore increasing demand for its products, demand which isn't even really demand uh, to the extent that government is going to mandate it in order for you to have a driver's license or whatever it is that they're going to, to hold in reserve. Um, this is a, <clears throat> a perfect environment. And what I don't really understand, maybe maybe you can help me sort this and one I, out. Let, let me just add an addendum to that. Sure. The vaccine companies have no liability. So no matter how badly in, they injure you, you can't sue them. And if they impose an injury that is a chronic disease injury, like diabetes or seizure disorders, whatever, they've now created a lifetime um, customer for their other products. And this it will sound so cynical to many of your listeners that they probably will want to dismiss what I'm saying. And so I'm not even saying going to say that they do that or they're conscious of it. Right. But I'm saying that those when those incentives exist, it is bad for a society. Well, you know, the, 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 what we want to do in an economic system and a democratic system is incentivize good behavior and punish bad behavior. And we want to create an economy that does those things and economic rules that do those things. And we've created the opposite. So. We've, it is actually true that that's all you have to do. I know this sounds wrong, yeah. but if that's all you I did, know that. you know it. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it will sound wrong to many. But if that's all you did was create a system in which externalizing harm onto others was costly and innovating uh, actual generation of wealth rather than transfer of wealth uh, paid, if that's all you did, the system would evolve towards producing benefits um, yeah. And it would avoid. And, and that's the answer to the first question that we began with. How do you reclaim the system? You create, you rationalize the economic rules so that they do what we want an economy to do, which is to reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. And because you cannot legislate morality, right? You know, but you can you can create incentives that reward moral behavior and that punish immoral behavior. That's exactly right. If you set up, <laughs> if you set up those rules so that uh, people who are inclined to behave morally actually do well, then morality spreads. Yeah. Um, you you want to make it, you want to allow people to do well by doing good. Right. Rather than incentivizing them to um, make money by harming other people and externalizing their their, you know, the, their profits. Right. And if you're just the other side of that boundary and you actually allow people to profit through externalizing harm, what you get is uh, capture 3.0 because what happens is those who have control over something enlarge their control. And anyway, you end up with this shocking, uh, elaborate Baroque system in which Somehow, you know, uh, YouTube is now shutting down people who say true things into a camera on behalf of pharmaceutical companies. Um, and, you know, nobody sees it coming. I am stunned in my own social circles at the unwillingness of anybody who has not seen the full picture to recognize that Pharmaceutical skullduggery three years ago would not have been controversial um, in any group of intelligent people having a conversation about policy. It was simply expected that there was regulatory capture and that uh, evidence didn't necessarily mean what it appeared to mean. In other words, all intelligent people would have taken it uh, as an assumption that there was some degree of corruption in policy that affects pharmaceuticals. During the pandemic, the only people who talk about this are people who, in my opinion, have their eyes open and have seen just how bad the policy is. There's no ability to even raise the question. Others simply assume corruption is playing no role here. 
How can that be? <laughs> uh, you know, it's part of this uh, very, very, I mean, inexplicable um, uh, disconnect, cognitive disconnect. Um, but I, I mean, like the, the company, the four companies that make all of the U.S. vaccines have those, which are Sanofi, Pfizer, Axel, and Merck, collectively have paid, <clears throat> excuse me, $35 billion since 2009, so over a 10 year period in criminal penalties, in damages uh, for falsifying science, for lying to regulators, for, uh, for bribing, blackmailing, and uh, <laughs> physicians and, <laughs> and regulatory officials. And those companies, and killing hundreds of thousands of people with drugs they knew were lethal. For example, Vioxx uh, killed between Merck with Viox, which up until 2006 killed between 120,000 and 500,000 Americans with a drug that they knew was going to cause those heart attacks. In fact, when you know when they when we sued them and got their uh, their their flow charts from their bean counters to the to their legal and marketing officials, they said, we're going to kill all these people, but we're still going to make money, even if we have to pay them off. A problem, and you can, you know, every drug kills somebody. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with marketing a drug that does kill a certain number of people, as long as you're honest with people about what the risk is. Right. You know, we... we we live in with grown-ups, and people have to make assessments about what risk they're they're uh, willing to endure for what benefits. And it, but in that case, Merck knew what the risk was, and it didn't tell anybody. So it was marketing a headache pill that it knew caused heart attacks. And most of the people who took that pill would probably have said, "You know what? I, I'll, I think I'll take an aspirin." And because I, but, but Merck never let them make that decision because it never gave them the data. These companies um, are, uh, are the same companies that brought us the opioid, you know, Johnson & Johnson. The opioid epidemic, which is killing 56,000 Americans a year, more kids than died in the 20 year Vietnam, but we're having a Vietnam every year from the opioids. And they hatched it, they knew it was gonna happen, and they did it anyway. So how, do you, how do you say, okay, the reason that those, that they got caught for those crimes they paid the $35 billion was because private plaintiff's attorneys like myself sued them on behalf of an injured client. And then in the discovery process came across documents that showed criminal conduct and walked those documents down to the U.S. attorney's office and said, you know, you need to sue them and put them in jail. And the only place that can happen is with vaccines. Because in vaccines, no matter how badly they injure you, you can't sue them. So would you explain so there's no that? discovery, there's no deposition, there's no class actions, there's no multi-district litigation, they can never get caught. So why, if you are, you know, a liberal Democrat and you know these companies are murderous, that is part of their business plan, that they are there, it's not even moral elasticity. It's a complete detachment from any kind of moral imperative at all. Why would you think? that they're going to hurt people with all their other pharmaceutical products. The one product where they can never get caught and they can never be liable, even if they do get caught, they're suddenly going to find Jesus and be, you know, honorable. It it defies any kind of, you know, of um, logical uh, analysis. I agree. It absolutely defies any kind of logical analysis to to imagine that you don't at least have average levels of corruption in this case. And, and they also there's no press scrutiny either. None. And there's no political scrutiny. So the politicians won't touch them. 
you can't bring them in front of a judge or a law court and there's no and the press you know defends them no matter what they do if you're that company why and you already are corrupt and and homicidal why would you suddenly you know not see the enormous opportunity Pfizer and Moderna have said that in 2022 they're going to make 900 million no or 9 billion dollars no 96 billion dollars 93 or 96 billion dollars from vaccines nobody's made products like uh, profits like that in history right why would you have qualms about a few people dying you know particularly since you're going to injure people who you can then sell other products to Right. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know what these conversations sound like inside these entities. I do know that what they are producing, I, one can detect from the outside, doesn't make the slightest bit of sense from the point of view of uh, a well-intended effort to control the pandemic, to limit the harm of this disease, to save lives, any of these things. Well, here's, here's what people need to understand about the Pfizer vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine we know more about because... They actually have gotten approval for that vaccine from the FDA. Um, they're not going to market. They, they got approval for a version. This was all a scam called the Comirnaty. Okay, so it's the same vaccine, but it has a different name. Yep. And they got approval for that one, but they did not want approval for the, the BioNTech vaccine. Why did they not want approval? Because... If they, as long as they have emergency use authorization, they cannot be sued. But once they get approval, now you can sue them. So right. if somebody gets injured for an approved vaccine, you can sue them. The only way they can get a shield from liability is if they get it recommended for children, because children's vaccines are immune from liability. And so, and, but, and the trick is that if you get it approved, recommended for children by the CDC, it not only has liability for children's injuries, but it has liability for adult injuries. Whoa, and so this is why they're driving so hard to vaccinate children, because it's the only way that they can get liability protection. And that is what this whole game is about. They know the, the the number the the key metric that you need to look at with vaccines is called NNTV, the number needed to vaccinate to save one life. Yeah. What is the NNTV for children? I'll tell you what it is. It's hundreds of thousands. You there because children don't get healthy children do not die from COVID. That's what the Lancet study said. They couldn't find anybody in the world, any healthy child who died in the world from COVID. So why would we give this to healthy children? Well, and they're, they're high risk. Let me, let me just outline one thing that people really should understand about this vaccine. When they, Pfizer did the study, it was supposed to be a three-year preclinical study. And it was the first time in history that a vaccine has had has been subject to peer review, randomized placebo controlled trials. So it was a good thing. We've never, the 72 vaccines we have for kids, none of them have gone through those trials, preclinical pre trials. I did not know that. I know one. And we sue them to say, I sued them with Aaron Siri from HiCan. Because for years I was saying this and they, you know, Tony Fauci and everybody was saying what he's saying is not true. So I, we sued them. We said, show us one study for any vaccine. But vaccines are exempt from safety testing. And, and that is a historical artifact that has to do with CDC's legacy as the public health service. So CDC, the public health service was a military agency quasi-military agency. And that's why people at CDC have military ranks like Surgeon General and they wear uniforms because it's still part of the military. The vaccine program was launched as a national security defense against biological attacks on our country. So they wanted to make sure that if the Russians attacked us with anthrax or some other biological agent, we could quickly formulate a vaccine and then uh, administer it to 200 million American civilians with no regulatory impediments. 
as you know, for most medicines, before they get approval, they need to go through randomized double blind placebo studies, double blind meaning neither the researcher nor the patient knows which is placebo and which is real. And those studies normally last five years. Why do they last so long? Because medicines cause injuries that have long diagnostic horizons or long incubation periods. You do not see them for five years. Even, even five years isn't long enough to know. Even five years isn't long enough, of course. But, you know, you need to have that five-year period. So they, they didn't want to do that for vaccines because they they said, we're going to be under assault and we need to get it right away. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to call vaccines by a different name because we call them medicines. We need to do those studies. So we'll call them biologics and we'll make biologics exempt from safety testing. So vaccines are not are the only medical product or device that never has to go through safety testing. So it was finally a good thing they did this for the Pfizer vaccine. Now, they were going to do a three-year study. It ended in 2022 or 2023. Um, but they stopped it after six months. Why did they stop it after six months? Well, I can't tell you what their internal discussions were, but I can tell you that the vaccine doesn't work after six months, which you know. Yep. So if you have no efficacy... After six months, you do have some efficacy during the first six months, so you can justify it. But those numbers, every month you go after that, are going to be dragged down until the clearly the, the harms, um, you know, the harms axis is going to cross the the efficacy axis, right? And nobody's going to be able to justify it. So they had to stop it after six months. So, so they unblinded it meaning they told all the people in the placebo group, you got the placebo and now we're going to vaccinate you. So after that, there's no way to do a study because right. everybody's now vaccinated. Yep. So what? So then they, they, Pfizer took the data from that first six months and they brought it to FDA and they got an approval. Here's the key metric that you want to look at. All-cause mortality. Does the vaccine after six months are more people alive in the vaccine group than in the placebo group? You want that to be the case. Here's what happened. Of the 22,000 people in the vaccine group, 20 died. Of the 22,000 people in the placebo group, 14 died. So the risk of getting the vaccine it includes a 48% greater risk of death, according to their own clinical trials. How in the world would FDA approve a product at their own data show that it has a 48, you have a 48% greater risk of dying in six months if you get the vaccine? Here's why. There were two people in the placebo group who died of COVID. It was one per of the 22,000 during that six month, two in the placebo group died of COVID. It was one person who died in the vaccine group of COVID. Therefore, Pfizer was able to make the claim that the vaccine is 100% effective against COVID because two is 100% greater than one. So, so. Uh, now, when, <laughs> when Americans hear the vaccine, it's 100 percent, which Tony Fauci and everybody repeat. What they think that means is that if I take the vaccine, I have 100 percent chance of not dying from COVID. <laughs> That's not what it means. So but they're not telling you that it's a it's a trick that a gimmick they use. It's called relative risk instead of absolute yeah, risk. Instead of absolute. Right? Yeah. So and here's what. The even worse news is in the vac in the vaccine in the placebo group, one person died of a heart attack. In the vaccine group, five people died of heart attacks. So there's a five hundred percent increased risk for heart attack if you get the vaccine by their own numbers. And furthermore, there is a there's a. Uh, it, every life that's saved from from COVID, four people die from the vaccine. So 
that's not a good metric from heart attacks. So every life is saved from COVID, four people die from, from vaccine heart related heart attacks. And they, and the, to go back to where we started, what then is the number needed to vaccinate? Well, to avoid a, a death from COVID, you need to vaccinate 22,000 people to save one life. You better make sure that that vaccine is so safe that none of those 22,000 are going to die from the vaccine. But their own data say that five, five of those people are going to die from heart attack for excess deaths because there's one in the placebo group that died. And you have to, none of those people were kids. There was only 1,300 kids in the study. So, and we know that Pfizer lied because we know that Maddie Gary, who was a, you know, 13 year old girl in that study, she got seizures immediately after the vaccine. She ends up uh, apparently permanent paralysis in a wheelchair for life, eating out of a feeding tube. And Pfizer wrote that down, told FDA that was a stomach ache. Oh, we know there was cheating going on. So we do know there was cheating going on. If I remember the story correctly, basically they declared it a stomach ache, which allowed them to unblind at which point they stopped recording so that it doesn't get recorded at the full level of harm. Right. Is that is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So we do know that there were shenanigans of all kinds. We also know in your description of all of these things are all of the things that you actually want to measure. This is not a hard problem, right? Well, number number fact, needed legally, to treat. Legally, before FDA approves a vaccine, you know, there's that committee called VERPAC, and it. it's not actually FDA, it's a panel in FDA that is made up mainly of Anthony Fauci's PIs. And then there's another panel that were recommended, in other words, mandated in CDC, which is called Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices. And they also are Tony Fauci's PIs. He keeps saying there's an independent panel that's looked at They're not independent. They work for him and for Bill Gates. So those people are required by law to know the number needed to vaccinate. That is a key metric that they must consider and yet, they never considered it. They approved the vaccine without considering something they were legally obligated to consider. Okay, so they approved it, even though number needed to treat doesn't justify, especially in light of a vaccine that is as unusual, as novel as these vaccines are, they didn't know this number. And then in the aftermath, they're not monitoring all cause mortality. And so, the point is we are specifically, whatever the explanation is, whatever the conversations sound like, we are specifically avoiding the measures that would allow us to detect if we were making a mistake. Let's say it's an honest mistake. If it's an honest mistake, yes. and then you take the measures and you, oh my goodness, we're actually, you know, the all cause mortality does not support the use of these vaccines. And that's before we even get to whatever their long-term arms might be. Right. That would be a stopping condition. But by not monitoring this, right, by vaccinating a control group so that you can no longer tell whether or not the people in the control group are actually healthier, we're blinding ourselves. Yeah. And not only that, but we they deliberately have a injury surveillance system that is intended to fail. It was built to fail. So that's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is the system that is a voluntary system. If you get a vaccine injury, your doctor is supposedly required to report it. Um, but it's up to him to decide whether it was a vaccine injury. Before. Most doctors don't want to report it. Many of them don't even know about the system, but most of them don't recognize vaccine injuries. If you die within three months of a vaccine, you should be reported no matter what you died of. That should be part of the database and it should be and and under the law, if you're part of a clinical trial, every death during a clinical trial must be attributed to the intervention unless proven otherwise. So we should have the same rule that if somebody dies two or three months after the vaccine, it's assumed to be vaccine related until proven otherwise. 
In fact, what happens is almost no vaccine injuries get reported. If you're the doctor yep. and you tell the patient or you tell the family, uh, this, you, your dad needs to get this vaccine and or he's going to die. And they say, well, what, you know, could it hurt him? And he says, no, it's totally safe. It's proven safe. He gives it to him. The father then dies 17 days later. And uh, they, and most deaths, 99% of deaths, there's no autopsy. For older people, there's never an autopsy, almost never. Autopsy costs $5,000, so people aren't going to do it. So the doctor's incentive is to say, no, no, I did not kill your father. The vaccine did not kill him, right? right. So people it's die. just human nature. Yeah. People die, so they don't report it to VAR, so nothing gets reported. And... Actually, we've known this for decades and important people have who are part of the you know medical mainstream, like David Kessler, his former Surgeon General, has said this, this system is completely broken. As a result of that, in 2010, HHS retained or contracted a sub-agency, the Agency for Healthcare Research, HR, Research Quality, HRCQ, to study the VAR system to see how effective it was. And AHRQ, and to develop a machine counting system that would not have the defects of a voluntary system. That, and so how do you do that? It's easy to do. You go to the HMOs, HMOs have all the vaccine records of every patient. They have all the medical claims. And you do, like I said right. before, a cluster analysis. And you get 95% of the vaccine injuries are going to appear on that. Yep. Okay, if there's a vaccine causing diabetes, juvenile diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, ticks, Tourette's, you will see that. So, and you can stratify by age, by gender, by, you know, by in every way, and you can figure out exactly what's causing the problems, and then you can cure it. So, AHRCQ developed, not only studied one of the HMOs, uh, the, uh, an HMO in Boston called Harvard Pilgrim, one of the 10 big ones. They also developed a machine counting system, which they plugged in at Harvard Pilgrim. And what they found was that the machine counting system was collecting something like 40, 40 times the number of injuries that 40 to 99 times the number of injuries that the voluntary that system. The VARA system catches, yep. And what they concluded was that the VARA system was not just missing 99% of injuries, it was missing more than 99%. That's how bad it is. And the AHRQ, the plan was to roll their machine counting system out to all the other HMOs. And as soon as CDC show, show that, saw that data and showed an injury rate of 2.7%, so one in every 40 people who came in to get a vaccine were suffering some kind of noteworthy injury. They said, we are telling people that injuries only occur one in a million. And, um, and they shut, not only did they shut down the whole project, but they stopped answering the phone calls of their sister agency. How do I know that? Because HRQ, it a peer reviewed publication. Anybody can look it up. It's called Lazarus 2010. And they say in it, CDC no longer would answer our phone calls once we gave them the data. So Tony Fauci knows that system because he's been told many, many times that system is on a shelf at HHS, ready to roll out. And if you really wanted to know whether these vaccines were injuring people, they can do it overnight. And yet he left it there and left us with a system that he knows is collecting probably less than 1% of vaccine injuries. So there's some bad interaction between public health and medicine. Medicine being targeted at helping the individual, public health being targeted at the overall rate of various disorders. Public health 
clearly feels entitled to lie, right? Yes. That from the point noble of view, lies. it claims they're noble lies. Um, yeah. Those who look into these lies begin <laughs> to wonder what the hell is driving them. But nonetheless, because public health feels entitled to lie in order to simplify the story so that people will, for example, uh, get vaccinated uh, to control a, a contagious disease. What it does, if you don't take the data that then allows people to understand just what the rate of adverse events is, is it interrupts informed consent, yes. right? Your doctor doesn't know how dangerous what you're being exposed to is. You don't know how dangerous and therefore your doctor accepting that it is worth the risk for you and you're accepting that it is worth the risk for you is it's something you're not capable. You're not capable of giving your informed consent because you're misinformed. It's misinformed consent. And so the funny thing, funny, there's nothing funny about this, but you say the very system is built to fail. We know, we know well that it dramatically undercounts. Is it getting 3%? Is it getting 10%? Is it getting 1%? We don't know, but we know no. it's not getting the majority of these events. And yet with these vaccines, there's an off the chart signal. An off the chart signal that when it is called in VAERS, right? In VAERS, a system that is difficult. right, yeah. despite the fact that the system is built well, more than half of the vaccine deaths that have occurred since the system was put in place in 1986 over 40 years, um, have occurred in the last since the rollout of these vac uh, the COVID vaccines. Yeah. Oh, there's like, a, it's not just a hockey stick. It's a right angle turn off the, off of the graph. Yeah. No, it's, and so that tells you something. And then when that is pointed out to the authorities, what you get back is here are the reasons that we don't believe the VAERS data, which even if that was correct, it leaves you with no understanding of how dangerous this is. It leaves you with no data, which does not, it's yeah, not the I'm same a, thing as <laughs> an indication that they're safe. Yeah. So sure. the whole thing, it behaves like something that doesn't want to know. And the fact is when your health or worse, your children's health is dependent on some system that claims to have rendered something safe, but is actively avoiding the information that would tell you that it had made an error, that is the opposite of safe. Yeah, well, you know, and, and here's how kind of pervasive it is and how it's infiltrated the media because everybody is part of this has been co-opted into this conspiracy to tell people, to gaslight people who say that they've been injured, to marginalize them, to silence them, to deplatform them. You know, it's not just me who's talking about the generalized risks, you know, and talking about science, but it's a mother or a dad or a child who lost a parent who says, here's what happened when they got the vaccine, has a video of, you know, the parent um, going into the seizure or the child going into the seizures immediately after vaccination. And if you put that out, you will be, you will be disappeared. So when this is early in the pandemic, you know, Hank Aaron was part of who I knew was part of a, um, of a can national campaign because blacks are very, very vaccine resistant a long history of, of mistrust of the medical establishment. And um, and so the CDC was rounding up civil rights leaders and sports leaders who are African-American to publicly take the vaccine. So Hank Aaron went on stage and got the vaccine at Emory University. And then, and 17 later, days later, he dies. And I wrote an article for the Defender for Children's Health Defense and talked about it on my podcast. And um, and I said, I never said his death was caused by the vaccine and nobody accused me of saying that. What I said is that his death was part of a wave of deaths that we're seeing in elderly people immediately after vaccination, which is completely documented. And uh, and I was immediately attack, attacked by the New York Times, by USA Today, CNN, ABC, NBC, thousands of news organizations literally around the world who were saying that I was lying. And, I, and the New York Times said that they had spoken to the um, to the uh, to the Atlanta uh, coroner. 
and that the Atlanta coroner had told them that Hank Aaron did not suffer from a vaccine injury, that this was not, it was not vaccine related. So I called the Fulton County coroner because I wanted to know what test they use to make that determination because, you know, mostly vaccine injuries and deaths don't leave fingerprints. So you don't know whether the person died of a heart attack or a stroke that he would have had anyway, or whether the vaccine contributed. And I, and I was curious about how they had made such a, how they had such certitude about that determination. And when I got the coroner on the phone, they said to me, we never saw Hank Aaron's body. We never performed an autopsy. The family buried wow. that body and nobody ever did a postmortem on it. And yet the New York Times reported a lie. And there's just this this incredible impulse in the and you know when I reported my conversation, it was just silence. There was no effort for, by the Times or any of these other papers to correct their error. It's um, it's quite extraordinary that everybody is part of this effort to make sure that nobody believes that people believe the vaccines are completely safe and completely effective. And anybody who disagrees with that, it's, you know, punished. Yeah, anybody anybody who asks questions, who asks questions. Is, is punished. And the punishment, um, I think it is largely going to be invisible to anybody who hasn't been on the wrong end of it. But the right. punishment is absolutely ruthless. It is gaslighting. And I must say, it's not the first time I've been demonized. Um, it is the first time I've been demonized by something that clearly has a many million dollar budget. It is a whole different experience. And um, the idea that there are billions, I presume hundreds of billions of dollars at stake in the market for COVID treatments and vaccines, and uh, that a cost of doing business would be uh, some number of millions to just simply demonize those small number of people who didn't get the memo and raised obvious questions about all cause mortality or number needed to treat or absolute versus relative measures of effectiveness, right? Um, you know, it, of course, they're going to be successful at controlling the narrative, especially when they have partners in uh, in the tech platforms who are willing to do their censoring for them. Now, let me ask you this. You raised the issue of the uh, the kids vaccines, which uh, today is in some ways a, a historic day or maybe yesterday was yesterday. The CDC unanimously recommended approval of the vaccine uh, for five to 11 year olds. Um, I did not understand that there was a uh, a hidden incentive for that, that that would actually give the adult vaccines um, immunity. As, uh, do I understand that correctly? Yes. That is shocking. Um, I did know of the prior story where the emergency use authorized vaccine retained its uh, liability immunity. Shield. Um, and that a person who after the vaccine was given authorization um, not authorization, given approval, a person who went in and got the authorized but not approved vial, even though in theory they contained the identical uh, substances. Yeah, they just have different labels. They had different labels, but a person who got vaccinated wouldn't even know what they were vaccinated with and therefore wouldn't understand that they were actually being vaccinated with something that gave the manufacturer immunity from liability, even though the FDA had signed off on it at that point. So these games are everywhere. And I will say the the most common theme throughout all of this seems to be accounting shenanigans, right? The label on the bottle uh, affects your ability to sue or not to sue. Uh, somebody who dies um, with COVID is presumed to have died of COVID. A person who has been vaccinated but hasn't been two weeks out from their vaccine is treated as unvaccinated. All of these things are used to create a story that is not true. Um, but in any case, yesterday, the CDC unanimous recommendation for the five to 11 year olds to be vaccinated. I can see exactly zero medical justification for this. As you point out, healthy children do exceedingly well with COVID. It's not a dangerous disease to them. What's more, 
Plus, they had lifetime immunity. They get probably. lifetime immunity. So, from the point of view of and a very robust and broad spectrum immunity that is going to protect them against all variants, and unlike the vaccine immunity, which is a very narrow spectrum and which requires then boosters year after right. year after year. And those <clears throat> those boosters each come with a risk of adverse events. Exactly. So, from the point of view of the medical well being of a child, this is a very strange. It's decision. very clear that it is damaging. That you're going to cause far more problems, or injuries than you're going to avert. And you know, but the, uh, the it seems also clear that the rationale is economic rather than a public health rationale. Well. I agree with you. I also, the more I think about it, the more this does feel like a modern Tuskegee, a Tuskegee without race, because effectively these children are not in a position to consent, right? Just as participants in the Tuskegee experiment were not informed, right? They were told they were going to get free health care and they did not understand what, what it was that they were being signed up for and what harm they might come to. This is effectively that with no medical justification, we are apparently going to push vaccines towards children who would be better off if they got the disease out of the way. I mean, we, I, I want to be careful in saying that because there is we do not know that 20 years down the road from a COVID infection, that it is not going to reemerge and some harm come from it. But based on what we do know about COVID, the harm to young, healthy children is absolutely minimal. And that means that the adverse events that children will face if they are vaccinated um, are uncompensated. And the also, you know, there's really strong indications, for example, you have the story of Maddie Gary. And we know it's one of thir they're, they're, they're gonna give this to 26 million kids and they only tested it on 1300. And one of the 1,300, we know at least one of them is spending their life in a wheelchair with a feeding tube. And that's just the beginning of Maddie Gary's suffering because her, her, her life is now a nightmare of agony. Um, so what we have to assume, you know, if we, if we look at the reason we have clinical trials is to look at the risk from if you give it to the entire population. So if there's a one in 1300 risk of ending up in a wheelchair for life with a feeding tube, uh, you have to extrapolate that out to 30, 26 million people. And you may be able to do that in your head, but I think it's like 20 to 35,000 kids who might, who potentially are now going to be exposed to that risk. And, uh, you know, that's a much, much higher risk than the risk from that we know of from COVID. Well, we have to leave open the possibility that uh, Maddie Gary was very, very, very unlucky. And well, yeah, but here's the thing. Under federal law, the any injury that occurs during a clinical trial must be attributed to the intervention. And so they legally, the regulators and the company must legally assume that that is a one in 1300 risk that's going to apply across the population. Right. That, should be, that should be the presumption. And that, then it could be demonstrated that it was just a fluke. But uh, of course, short of that demonstration, we have uh, to course. assume that that's that's the baseline. But, you know, if you're only going to test your intervention on 1300 people before you give it to 26 million, you ought to be stuck. Yes. With whatever oh, the outcome is. Especially these, these, I mean, I must tell you the, the recommendation to vaccinate young children for this shocks me more than anything I've seen so far. And I've been repeatedly shocked, but this is so brazen and so indifferent to the suffering of people who cannot know better cannot presumably say no it it's inconceivable to me that um let's put it this way as an evolutionary biologist i almost never use the term evil because i believe you almost never see evil it's a terrible strategy right it, it, it 
amorality is a good strategy. You see that regularly. Uh, sociopathy is a good strategy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an amorality. But this is so... Um, yeah. So brazen and the harm will come to literal innocence that I, I don't think there's another term. I really do think that this is a, um, this is an atrocity in the making. And, uh, I don't know what we do about it, but I do think maybe, maybe because the evidence is so clear that children, healthy children, do not suffer serious harms from COVID itself. And because even the broken VAERS system captures this huge signal for adverse events, including deaths from these vaccines, that many people who have gone along with the public health narrative so far will detect that something is wrong. Something must be wrong for us to be dragging our children into this when, frankly, they are a population that just doesn't need this protection. Now, what I suspect is that in many of these people's minds, there's a conflation between the well-being of the individual and the control of the pandemic. And although I think it is an appalling argument, one could make a rational argument for vaccinating children to control the spread of the disease. Of course, these vaccines are not effective at controlling spread, but nonetheless, that might be on some people's minds. But even that, what healthy society transfers health risk from, from children? How do you justify putting a children at risk in order to uh, preserve, in order to protect all people um, you know, we, listen, this is always, this is like a baseline philosophy 101, yeah. um, you know, uh, a, a dilemma exercise, and it always has the same outcome as you don't, you know, a government cannot put one person at risk to save somebody else. You know, you know that's just something that we understand in Western liberal democracies and in Western civilization that you don't do that. As a, and yet, um, and not only is it other people, but it's kids. You're, yeah, you're I mean, I, I, I do, I, I will push back a little bit. I do think we put one person in harm's way to protect another. We do that well, when we draft know, the, the people. Dilemma that they, it's called, I think it's called the trolley. The dilemma. trolley problem, yeah. yeah. The trolley problem, whether you whether you pull the switch, if there's six people who are going to get hit, do you pull the switch and let the one person? And I think the answer to that dilemma is if you're an individual that you may do that, but we don't let governments make those decisions if possible, because, you know, once... Once you give a government, here's the problem. Once you give a government the right to sacrifice human life for the good of the community, you're on a slippery slope to, you know, the worst kind of um, uh, ruthless, barbaric, totalitarian decision making. Yeah. And, you know, um, because really it's better than you can say, well, is better for society, you know, old people in our society don't make much contribution and a 80% of our healthcare costs go to people in the last year of life. Wouldn't it be better just to get rid of them early? And if government can make that decision, it can make some really brutal decisions. And that's, you know, what we saw. And I'm not making the comparison with Nazism because that also is a slippery slope. But, you know, that's one of the reprehensible things we saw from the Nazis very early on is they involved all of the doctors in saying, we're going to give, give these yellow cards to, uh, uh, you're required to report anybody in your practice who has, um, who's intellectually disabled, anybody who's gay and anybody who has physical defects. And then the state would come and get rid of those people. And we and that is the end point when we start saying that government has a right to, you know, to uh, sacrifice children to save, theoretically save older people. Yeah, it, it, it makes no sense. And just as a hypothetical, I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm, uh, I don't find this a terribly long stretch from uh, Nazi 
I mean, especially Nazi doctor, you know, Mengele's experiments, for example, right? Um, well, the doctors were so badly behaved that they had to have separate trials in Nuremberg just for the doctors. And there wasn't a single doctor or medical association who's, who came forward in Germany. You know, that's the astonishing thing. Well, I, I, I want to be clear. I'm not arguing that a doctor who vaccinates children yeah, is the equivalent. Yeah, neither am I. Right. No, of course not. But uh, I, I want to make clear that what I'm saying is that a government that can decide, well, for the good yeah. of the many, will sacrifice the few, may engage in twin experiments, for example. Yes. Um, and I'm, I uh, have cousins who were twins in Mengele's experiments. So I, I take this very personally. But let's just say as a hypothetical here. If the idea is it is okay to put children at risk of serious injuries in order to control a pandemic that mostly harms the old and the infirm, then what is the distinction between that and deciding that those in need of a kidney can source that from the population that we can just, you know, people have two kidneys, they can live with only one. And therefore, you know, maybe government can decide to appropriate kidneys from healthy people to people who need them, right? It's not that different, right? It should be the case that we do not vaccinate children unless it is in the interest of those children to be vaccinated. Yeah, I think that's the bottom line. That is the bottom line. Yeah, I think everybody, the stuff that we're talking about, everybody, anybody can dispute it. I don't think, I think it's pretty hard to dispute that statement. Yep, I think so too. And it's also important to point out that the original premise, which is there's no evidence that vaccinating children will protect adults. Right. So, you know... Right. So somehow, <laughs> again, the driver seems to be um, vaccinate everybody. Uh, there seems to be games played with legal liability that us lay people don't know anything about, you know, never in the discussion of uh, whether or not to authorize vaccination of five to 11 year olds. Did I hear that uh, the liability of adult vaccines was somehow in play? That seems like an important consideration. It seems like a place where if corruption was going to rear its ugly head, you would expect to see it. And yet it was never mentioned. So where's the press? I mean, did you see it? Was it discussed? No, that's not in the press. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a remarkable, remarkable fact. It will be breaking news on this podcast. <laughs> right. Um, well, so I, I think we're heading towards wrapping up here. Um, there are, of course, a dozen things I, uh, I know that we haven't touched upon that we probably should, but of course, what we have touched upon is already fairly mind bending and, um, people are going to, I think need some, uh, some room to, to digest it. Uh, <clears throat> where, where do you foresee, where do you foresee us going? Your, your book comes out on the 16th. I will remind people. The book is The Real Anthony Fauci. It is uh, an amazing read. It's beautifully written and um, really my experience. And again, I haven't I haven't come close to finishing the book yet, but my experience is almost every paragraph is shocking in its own right. Um, what do you foresee happening? Do you, do you think this book is going to uh, wake people up to the danger that that the pandemic is being mismanaged and that um, Anthony Fauci is somewhere in the center of that? That's my hope. Uh, you know, it's hard to um, predict what... Uh, I really stopped making predictions, Brad, because <laughs> I have been consistently wrong about how low I think, you know, how bad things... Whether we've hit bottom? <laughs> yeah, whether we've hit bottom. So I... You know, I really, my, um, my approach is to just keep trying to get the truth out, trying to pursue the truth, but trying to be, you know, uh, be a good human being myself and try not to, not to do things that polarize people, um, but to constantly reach out to people who disagree with me and try to find some common ground you know, because I think we're in a 
We're in the worst epic of polarization in this country since at least the Civil War. I, 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 I see the I same. Very, very dangerous. Um, and we're going to lose, you know, this country. Um, or we're at risk of losing it. We've already lost many of the these very, very uh, important institutions of our democracy, and we need to figure out a way to reclaim them. And we're not going to do that by fighting each other. No, and I will say um, you're uh, very clear in your thinking. You're very easy to get along with. I think, frankly, in some sense, uh, it has been easier to demonize you than it has been to deal with your arguments, and that's why you've faced the uh, brutal campaign that you have faced. Um, maybe there are a couple things we should take care of before we before we finally wrap this up. Um, without putting words in your mouth, I do want to have a sense of is there such a thing as an anti-vaxxer? Are you one? How should we think about this? There are people who are uh, anti-vaccine who are just believe that vaccines are um, are always uh, messing with the immune system is misguided, and that the way to that basically you know it's the old argument with Pasteur. Is it the terrain? If you protect, if you build your immune system, um, is that, are, are you then, do you become resistant to disease? And there's very good evidence that healthy people, that well nourished people, people, societies with good sanitation, um, don't get sick from infectious disease. And in fact, there, you know, the CDC has done a, a series of studies. Um, one of them that, you know, is important, it's called Geyer, G-U-Y-E-R. It's published in Pediatrics in uh, 2000. And it's by CDC and, NI and uh, Johns Hopkins scientists. And they looked at the issue about whether vaccines had actually anything to do with the decline in mortalities from infectious disease, which is this momentous medical event in the 20th, that occurred in the beginning of the 20th century. And what they found was that vaccines had almost nothing to do with the disappearance of infectious disease. That it was not, in fact, attributable to medical interventions at all, but mainly engineering, uh, the development of flush toilets, of sanitation, of hydrogen chlor chlorinated water, um, and then good nutrition roads that could bring oranges from Florida and all those kind of interventions. There's other. Uh, studies, many other ones. There's another one called McKinley and McKinley uh, back in the 70s. That was required reading in almost every medical school in our country that say the same thing. So the people who are completely anti-vax have arguments. They're not crazy people. I'm not one of those people. What I think is I'm not against any intervention if it can prove itself with science. My position is that we should have double-blind, placebo-controlled studies prior to the licensing of vaccines. And if, 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 it, if it shows that people who take that vaccine are more likely to live and have better health than people who don't, then I'm for it. If you can't show that, then I'm against it. And that is completely my position. Um, so I think the term anti-vax is a pejorative that is applied to me in order to marginalize me, to make me look like I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm crazy or and that people don't have to listen to my arguments. They can dismiss me for who I am. And so, and I think that's so much of the strategy to, is to silence debate rather than actually conduct it and entertain it, which is what we ought to be doing in a democracy. And democracies are about, they, they flourish on the free flow of information, at least that's the theory that policies that are annealed in the cauldron of debate are more likely to, uh, you know, to steer us in a good direction than if we silence dissonance. Yes. And I think, um, you know, there is the issue of censorship and there is the issue of making an example of people who do what you've done and what I have been doing. Um, 
And it's very effective that you can spook people into not seeing the, the truth that's right in front of them by uh, showing that you can drive up the costs of those who do see it. Now, I will say, um, I don't know that my position is identical to yours uh, as you've stated it, but it sounds very similar. Um, I will add, uh, not only, I, I'm, I still love um, the mechanism of vaccination, the idea of putting information into a system that can use that information to fend off diseases it has never seen before. I still believe that that's an incredibly elegant mechanism. But my guess is that it needs to be used sparingly and that the market forces that see, you know, any vaccination that can be justified in a context where harms can be downplayed uh, and benefits can uh, be over uh, hyped and and all of this <clears throat> that what we ought to be realizing is that like everything else that there is some uh, sweet spot that probably there are some diseases for which there is a net benefit for this mechanism. We ought to identify which ones those are. But most importantly, I don't think we are capable of identifying which things are in the interest of patients, which things are in the interest of society, if there is a for-profit sector driving that has inputs into the regulatory apparatus. That's simply a deal breaker from the point of view of good governance, proper regulation, and the protection of patients and citizens from harm. And so really, you know, <laughs> I think we're in the very ugly position of being demonized for being against treatments as if this is born of some Luddite impulse, mm -hmm. right? Rather than being alarmed at the degree to which corruption has hijacked this process and created uh, a mandate for products that uh, create alarming adverse event signals, right? So I don't know how we get out of that trap. I don't know how we get people to view the concern as about corruption and uh, informed consent rather than about some, you know, Paleolithic resistance to modern medicine. Yeah, well, I don't have any uh, anything to add to that. That would be that would you know enlarge on it. I think that's exactly right. You know, we need to rationalize the marketplace. We need to rationalize the regulations so that its objective is to serve public health rather than to serve the profit interests of companies who are making these products. Yep, I think that's uh, very well summarized. All right. Well, Thank Bobby you, Kennedy. Brad. Uh, Brad, I hope I continue to see you on the airwaves. So I, this isn't the, your I, swan song. I hope so, too. <laughs> um, you know, I guess that depends in part on whether or not um, the people who can hear us uh, will defend what we're doing, because it's obviously, I mean, this is what free speech is for. It is for having difficult discussions like this. And... Uh, Anyway, I applaud you for, for being so dogged uh, in fighting the good fight, and uh, I, I'll share a trench with you anytime. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Be well, everyone. <laughs>